hearing a question. I mean, it's almost time to get started. All right. Yeah. All Go. All right, everyone, I will call this meeting to order. Thank you so much for being here. This is exciting. It's always a, a huge day. Campus, uh, many folks from our community who are passionate and engaged and show up, I'm sure both here and the millions online on YouTube and um, all the influencers out there. Um, so to begin, I'd like to acknowledge with gratitude that we live and work on the traditional unceded territory of the Squamish Nation. These people have been stewards of these lands and waters surrounding the Fuelahem. Uh, Bowen Island. This is particularly salient today as we contemplate um, the disposition of Cape Roger Curtis, uh, an upper wonder on the west side of the island, uh, an area that has had a lot of history, uh, both ancestrally as well on uh, Bowen Island. So as we consider that, as we consider our commitments to our reconciliation, it's just something that I wanted to put out into the air and have us consider. Uh, welcome to the Bowen Island Municipality Committee of the whole meeting for February 27th, 2023. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I am Andrew Leonard, the Mayor of Bowen Island Municipality and the Chair of this meeting. I'd like to uh, begin, as I usually do, by introducing the other elected uh, members of Bowen Island's Council here this afternoon. And I will start to my uh, right today with Councillor Alex Jurgensen. To his left, Councillor Sue Ellen Fast. To her left, Councillor Judy Getty. Uh, on the far left, Councillor John Saunders. His right, Councillor Tim Wake. Um, and then to his right, Councillor Allison Morse. We are also joined by a number of folks on our professional staff uh, this afternoon, as well as uh, joined by some guests from uh, uh, Metro Vancouver, and I'll introduce those uh, here as well. Um, to my right is our Chief Administrative Officer, uh, Liam Edwards. And to my left is our Corporate Officer, Sophie Insignia. And uh, joining us from Metro Vancouver, we have Mike Redpath, the Director of Regional Parks, uh, Jeff Fitzpatrick. Um, what is your title exactly, Jeff, just so I don't get it wrong? I, yeah, it's the Division Manager of Regional Park Design and Development. Division Manager of Regional Park Design and Development. And uh, as well, we have Amanda McKegg, the uh, Director of Communications for Metro Vancouver. Okay, um, this meeting is being recorded. So when members of the public uh, come up for the Q&A sec uh, section and speak, your presence and voice will be included in the permanent record, which is available on bowenislandmunicipality.ca, uh, as well as live streaming worldwide right now. Um, this council meeting, this committee of the whole meeting is an official forum for the conducting of the business of local government. We all love our home. We are all passionate about what happens in our community. Uh, and I'd encourage everyone to maintain a constructive and respectful tone during the meeting and uh, during the Q&A section to uh, address comments to staff and to Metro Vancouver to myself. Before, what's I'd like to say? No. So the agenda in full uh, uh, package for this meeting is available online at bowenimunicipality.ca. And with that, I will seek for uh, an adoption or approval of the agenda. Uh, Council Morse. Uh, just one question for clarification. Yes. I just want to confirm that when we have the staff report at 4.1, that the recommendation that's underneath that staff report won't be dealt with until after we've had the public comments at section five. 
Yes, that is well stated. So uh, for folks that are following along on 4.1, attached to 4.1, which is the staff report that we'll get from the manager of planning, there is the recommendation there that um, receives the rezoning application, the OCP amendment, and then refers it to committees. I think to Councillor Morris's point, um, we won't be looking for a moving of that recommendation until we have the question and answer period in the public comments section of um, the meeting, as that would seem premature to make a decision and then ask for uh, feedback and input after the fact. Thank you, Councillor Morris. In that case, I'll move adoption to the agenda. Okay, uh, moved by Councillor Morris to adopt the agenda, seconded by Councillor Jurgensen. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand, say aye. 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 aye, seeing that opposed, motion carries. So moving on to item three, one of the main events of this afternoon, we have a presentation uh, from uh, Metro Vancouver and the Metro Parks team, as well as Amanda here. I'll hand it over to you folks. Thank you, and thank you, Mayor Leonard and uh, members of the Bowen Island Council. It's a pleasure for us to be here today. Uh, as introduced by Mayor Leonard, my name is Mike Redpath. I'm the Director of Regional Parks, and uh, we have a presentation today um, regarding a proposed park at Cape Roger Curtis. Um, we've heard loud and clear from not just the Bowen Island community, uh, but from residents across the region of a great interest in preserving lands for regional parks. And we've also heard concerns about this specific park potential. And today we hope to address and to begin to addressing some of those concerns. And we look forward to engaging with you uh, in a very fulsome process. Um, we will be giving you a brief overview of the proposal in Metro Vancouver and regional parks, uh, talk about some details and how we believe some of those concerns may be addressed. Uh, we look forward to hearing about other concerns and how we can work together to ameliorate those over time. And we will be talking about our public engagement process, which is well underway right now. Um, with that, I will also introduce my colleagues uh, once more, Jeff Fitzpatrick, the uh, Division Manager of Design and Development for Regional Parks, uh, and Amanda McKay, who is our, um, my peer, and uh, she is our Director of Communications for Metro Vancouver. So uh, with that, Mayor Leonard, uh, we'll start our presentation. How do we advance the slides? I'll do that for you. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so advance the slide, there we go. Uh, Metro Vancouver, uh, we thought it was important for us to give you a brief overview of who we are uh, and generally what we do. Um, of course, here on Bowen Island, the presence for Metro Vancouver Regional Parks has been here for many years uh, with respect to Crippen Regional Park. We represent over 2.8 million residents across the Metro Vancouver region. We're a federation of 21 municipalities that does include Bowen Island municipality. And we take a regional view and one electoral area uh, and one Treaty First Nation, the Swasin Nation. Um, we collaboratively plan for and deliver large scale regional services, um, large and regional services. Our core services are drinking water, wastewater treatment, solid waste management, but we also regulate air quality, plan for urban growth, manage a regional park system, and um, manage an affordable housing program as well across Metro Vancouver. Our regional district is governed by a board of directors and elected officials, uh, which has population representation. And Mayor Leonard, um, you are on our parks committee as well as our board and I believe other committees as well, Metro Vancouver. So. Uh, next slide. Our regional park system uh, extends from here in Bowen Island to Langley and Abbotsford uh, and Maple Ridge in the, uh, in the east. We protect over 13,800 hectares of regional parkland and sensitive ecosystems across the region. Over 16.3 million visitors come to our regional parks in a year, and that number has skyrocketed since 2019. Since the pandemic, we've seen people's um, real interest in coming outside, connecting with the outdoors for their spiritual well-being, for their emotional well-being, and for their physical health as well. Um, just at Crippen Regional Park alone, we know that approximately 300,000 people come to this park each year, and about half of that visitation, hearing myself, uh, about half of that visitation is um, approximately from Bowen Island residents as well. Next slide. Our mandate is very simple. We think that it's very simple. It is that we protect the region's significant landscapes and natural areas, and we connect people to them. And it's always about that balance, protection and connection. Next slide. Our vision is that our parks are protected and resilient. Resilience is a key term for us these days, particularly with um, uh, 
issues that are definitely here. Climate change is a good example of that. In the last few years, we've seen wave after wave of atmospheric rivers. We even had a tornado uh, come to one of our parks that you may have seen from the shores here on Bowen last year. Um, we've had wildfires, we've had drought, we've had um, just a whole bunch of impacts of climate change. Building a resilient system is really key. Protecting the undeveloped green spaces in Metro Vancouver are a way of making Metro Vancouver more resilient for the future and to protect and to provide those great experiences for climate change um, uh, uh, resilience as well. We have some goals in regional parks that we like to talk about when we come out and speak to community in particular. These are goals that drive our regional parks plan. Uh, and there's five. One is that the natural areas are protect protected in perpetuity. Everyone has an opportunity to benefit from exceptional experiences in nature, that we sustainably manage and well maintain our park system for the safety of visitors and the integrity of the ecosystems that First Nations have an active role in the planning and the stewardship of our regional park system. And we work with all of our local 10 First Nations very closely in, in our role. And that our regional parks are adaptive. They're adapt to change and they contribute, as I said previously, to regional resilience. So why are we here? Next slide. That was like an awesome pause, so thank you. <laughs> um, they're gonna get better. Um, our request is that Bowen Island Municipal Council confirm their support for the proposed regional park at Cape Roger Curtis, including a proposed official community plan rezoning amendment to permit overnight use and camping. We are very grateful for the opportunity today to participate in this Committee of the Whole meeting, which is running parallel to a very robust public engagement process that has just been initiated. And we know that there's been a lot of questions about that process and there's been questions about this proposed use. Today, we hope to address many of those questions. We believe that the community's concerns, many of them are also our concerns as well. And we're trying to um, learn as we go along through the process, listen, and also most importantly, propose some opportunities to address those concerns. Next slide. We'd like to begin with a proposed overview of the proposed park at Cape Roger Curtis. And just a little bit about the project. Next slide. Metro Vancouver has an agreement to purchase 97 hectares, approximately 240 <laughs> acres of land at the southwest tip of Fallen Island here on, at Cape Roger Curtis. The intention of the acquisition is to establish a new regional park that would protect approximately 100 hectares of sensitive habitat and provide opportunities for people to connect with nature. Metro Vancouver has a park planning process, which I mentioned previously, and we have submitted an official rezoning and OCP amendment application to you, Bone Island Municipality, for the proposed regional park, specifically for the purpose of permitting overnight years camping at the, the site. The rezoning OCP amendment um, proposes a park with a variance to allow for supervised camping. This land use designation will allow for the creation of a regional park complete with conservation areas, day use amenities such as trails, picnic areas, viewpoints, and tent camping. Next slide. By way of some context, this map shows the location of the proposed park, which is on the southwest corner of the island, and of course, adjacent to the protected Bone Island Conservancy lands as well. <laughs> Next slide. The purpose of this acquisition is really to protect also region, a regionally rare ecosystem that includes coastal bluffs, rocky headlands, and dry coastal fir, dry ductless fir forests. And because the land has previously been prepared for residential development, the 10, uh, sorry, 24 10 acre lots, previous clearing has been undertaken. There is a very comprehensive road network, utilities, wells dug on each site, trails, as well as other servicing. It offers an amazing and unique opportunity to provide public access and opportunities for people to connect with nature. The existing development will lend itself, would lend itself to varied recreational programs, which we'll talk about more later. This area is much more like some of the Gulf Island experiences, which is much more accessible to regional residents. And it is obviously a West Coast iconic roughly landscape. Next slide. 
The reasons for expanding our regional park system and specifically for the creation of a new regional park here at Cape Roger Curtis are many. One of the main reasons that we pursue land acquisition across the regions, we believe that to have a more resilient region that nature actually needs half. Nature needs half of the uh, um, landscape to, to survive. We need permeable surfaces. We need places for nature, for shelter. We need places for, um, uh, because once these protected and sensitive ecosystems are gone, they will be gone forever and we cannot get them back. And this opportunity at Cape Roger Curtis is a significant opportunity to protect a rare and very disappearing sensitive landscape. The second opportunity is to protect, um, is to address our issue of uh, the loss of sensitive habitat across the region, the need to protect large natural areas, and to assure climate and ecological resilience. To provide access to nature and the critical health and wellness that the community um, benefits from are also associated with that. Mayor Leonard, I appreciate your acknowledgement at the commencement of the meeting, uh, and we believe that this park can also advance reconciliation and, and agree 100% with your comments at the beginning of the meeting. And we also know that the protection of this park, its landscape, also supports the vision of the, and I cannot say it, but the House Sound Biosphere Reserve. Can you say that for me? I can't. Alaska. Alaska. Thank you. I will get that. The next slide, please. The existing zoning of the site is rural residential one. Um, and uh, actually, every we understand that that zone would permit regional park. Today, we we're seeking is permission to be able to actually have overnight use through an OCP amendment. The OCP amendment is to permit the primary use of the land as regional park for nature protection, day and overnight use. The zoning amendment proposes passive park zoning with a permit to supervise overnight use. To permit supervised overnight use. It's important to note that, as again, as I previously mentioned, that park use is permitted on all Bowen Island municipality and land use zones. But the rezoning, and why we're here today, is particularly to uh, speak to the OCP amendment that we're seeking with respect to an overnight use camping program on these lands. Next slide. <clears throat> the existing zone permits um, residential dwellings, agriculture, horticulture, stables and kennels, and accessory uses, and our proposed zoning would, of course, support the open space interpretation and nature protection. Uh, there's some existing conservation covenants on the site, but the overall environmental protection for this site is very limited. As residential lots, as sub previously serviced and subdivised residential lots, the opportunity for removal of significant trees for residential development at this site is high. And that has already occurred for part of the Roger Curtis lands for the properties that have already developed. You can see for yourself the 10 and 15,000 square foot homes. That's what could potentially be on this site. What we're proposing is regional park, which is not that development. Uh, I think that's it for the rezoning. And then we're talking about OCP alignment. So next slide. We believe that our proposal aligns closely with your policies with respect to environmental sensitive area protection, <coughs> support for regional parks, providing public access to lands. We would like to introduce the concept of camping and low impact and sustainable tourism. And uh, Mayor Leonard, I will now pass it over to Jeff Fitzpatrick, who will talk about the park conservation programming and proposed facilities. Thank you, Mike, and good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, for nearly 100 years, naturalists have recognized that how uh, special this site is and have been coming to the area to observe and document its unique natural values. Even though the area of the island has been prepared for residential development with roads, trails, and infrastructure, as Mike outlined, it still includes some remarkable sensitive ecosystems and natural values. The dry rocky outcrops and meadows between locally rare flowers are shaded by shore pine, arbutus, and coastal juniper trees. Douglas fir dominated forests contain red cedar and hemlock, and a number of old growth uh, trees remain on site. There are ephemeral streams, wetland, and a number of seepages. And marine habitat in the area is known for beds of eelgrass and blue mussels, which attract seabirds and, and marine mammals. 
Next slide. There are at least 141 bird species using the area um, along, with uh, along with amphibian breeding areas, excellent habitat for reptiles, uh, garter snakes, and alligator lizards. This, the site is home to black-tailed deer, bats, otter, mink, and other mammals. And there are 40, 42 known uh, and possible species at risk, including the Pacific gray blue hare and, and northern red-legged frog. Uh, needless to say, the, par the proposed park presents some incredible opportunities for conservation, stewardship, habitat enhancement, and environmental education. Next slide. So in spite of the significant ecological values in the area, the land was previously subdivided and prepared for resident residential development, as, as Mike outlined. It is now 24 individual lots, each with an undeveloped home site accessed by a driveway and equipped with servicing, including wells and electricity. Parts of the site have restricted covenants to, uh, to limit different development activities. A paved municipal road system and dedicated trails form existing connections, and a series of inactive logging roads are still evident to traverse the site. This unique combination of existing infrastructure and significant ecological values can be adapted for park use, providing an opportunity uh, to establish the proposed regional park. Next slide, please. Park planning uh, design. Um, Park planning and design would focus on utilizing existing disturbed or developed areas for park activities that could include hiking, nature viewing, picnicking, as well as viewpoints and access to a key waterfront. Escape. Next slide. Metro Vancouver manages a range of overnight camping group camps and programs throughout the park system that provide opportunities for youth, families, and community groups to experience nature close to home. The provision of overnight programs uh, at this proposed regional park could provide visitors with opportunities for immersive nature experiences, such as stargazing and nighttime nature viewing. Next slide. Metro Vancouver is proposing the inclusion of supervised overnight tent camping facilities at the proposed park. Campsites would be located in previously dis uh, cleared areas that were cleared for development with an overall small footprint within the broader park. RV and trailer camping would not be allowed and access to overnight areas would primarily be by a park shuttle, trail or greenway. Overnight options would be phased in over time to allow for adaptive management and to assure any impacts were mitigated. Next slide, please. Um, we have heard why camping, why here? Um, well, there are a few reasons it's being proposed. The land acquisition is certainly a significant investment and the need to provide access to this landscape for regional residents who are not able to access the park on a day-to-day -day basis is important. This is a unique landscape with disturbed areas that provide an opportunity for overnight access without additional clearing, disturbance, or disturbance to sensitive ecosystems. Certainly the demand for camping is high. It's challenging to access camping close to home. And this site presents an opportunity to access that experience without a car, which is important given the increased number of people choosing to live without a personal vehicle or doing so due to cost. Thanks. Next slide. Uh, the preliminary land use plan included with the rezoning application provides a, an illustrative concept of the proposed overnight use. And of course, through a fulsome park planning process and public engagement research and analysis, will really guide the development of principles and land management practices, goals, and, and ultimately a, a full park concept. Next slide. Um, as Mayor Leonard mentioned earlier, the proposed park presents an opportunity to advance collaboration and reconciliation with First Nations. We have, have initiated discussions with Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations, which have been positive to date. Ultimately, uh, of course, it's up to the nations as to how closely they wish to work with us on the project. However, it's certainly our goal to explore every opportunity to work together in a good way. In particular, the Squamish Nation have long ties to Palakam, Bowen Island, and we hope that the park is an opportunity to advance reconciliation, support reconnection with the land, provide opportunities for cultural land use, to tell the story of the nation, and for traditional knowledge and different ways of knowing to guide park management over, over time. Next slide. Um, the opportunities the park presents are, are many. We've touched on many through the presentation today, but quickly to summarize, uh, the protection of 97 hectares of environmentally sensitive land in perpetuity. 
opportunities for community gatherings, connections, and involvement throughout the life of the park, improve health and well-being, new opportunities to connect with nature, habitat connectivity to adjacent conservation areas, alignment with the OCP, advancing the uh, Alaskan uh, House Sound Biosphere Reserve, reconciliation, and climate and ecological resilience. Next slide, please. Um, now, as you know, we have begun uh, the park uh, public engagement process, and we have a long way to go. We're just starting. Uh, to be clear, um, we don't have all the answers, but we are, have begun the discussion. And the purpose of the public engagement process to, is to engage deeply, to listen and to learn from local residents so we can respond to questions and concerns and shape the park proposal accordingly. In terms of some of the concerns and questions we have heard to date, there have been focused on three key areas, uh, transportation and access, fire risk management, and the overnight access. Uh, I'd like to just take a few minutes to share some additional detail on our proposed approach and preliminary thinking on these three areas. Next slide, please. Um, transportation and access. So it's clear that the need to ensure local traffic flows and avoiding impacts to BC ferry capacity are key concerns for local residents. And we share those concerns as well. The park presents an opportunity to plan a park right from the start that prioritizes non-vehicular access. From the physical planning and design of the park to the management of capacity access and communication. Access strategies will include the provision of a park shuttle, an improved multi-use pathway and greenway connections, along with some limited vehicular access to support accessibility and use. Metro Vancouver would propose to work collaboratively with the municipality to realize the multi-use path and optimize land use and amenities in Snug Cove to facilitate the shuttle and connections to the park. Next slide, please. Uh, phased implementation of park facilities and transportation solutions will allow for piloting and adaptive management. To ensure all solutions are fully explored, uh, a traffic study is underway comparing existing and proposed land use, and that will be completed in, in, in the weeks to come. We are also looking at opportunities to further restrict vehicle access, especially in the summer season. Capacity management tools could include a park reservation system, potential closure of the park to vehicular access on weekends or the summer season, with access by reservation on the park bus or shuttle. These are some preliminary ideas, as I said, um, the engagement will shape this going forward, but um, sorry, our thinking at this time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, working with Bonai Municipality to realize the greenway access to the park is important. The Cross Island Greenway is a key, is a key connection included in the regional greenway network, and we hope to change that uh, from red to green, as we said, uh, and to realize that greenway collaboratively. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, we have also heard questions regarding the proposed overnight access. So um, a few more um, details on this. The camping program is intended to be low impact, carefully managed, uh, and a sustainable way to access and enjoy an, a really incredible landscape. No trailers or RVs would be permitted. Access would be primarily by bike, hike, hike in, and park shuttle. There would be no open fires, and access would be regulated by a reservation system. The park would have 24 hour supervision by our uniformed park operation and ranger staff and an overnight camp host. And important to note, the overnight access would be phased in over time to allow for piloting, adaptive management, measuring success, and, and clear communication. Um, while the ultimate number, type, and location of sites will be determined through the planning process, <coughs> and overnight access would be phased over time to allow for adaptive management. A preliminary invest estimate of visitation at, at, a, at a full build out of 90 to 100 sites would mean 122 to 162 um, visitors on an average weekday with 29 to 39 vehicles associated with that. And on a weekend, we could expect 186 to 243 people on site and 32 to 43 vehicles associated with that. Now, these numbers and projections will, of course, be refined through the planning process. However, we expect the number of private vehicles on site should not be too much greater than what would be expected should 24 private homes uh, be developed as previously planned and zoned. Next slide, please. The proposed overnight use could be complementary to existing accommodation offerings on the island. 
a uh, quick Airbnb search shows the number of listings on the island, which are typically a little bit higher cost and, and accessed by private vehicles. So the low impact, affordable and cycling park bus focused accommodation proposed for the park would uh, be in alignment with uh, some of the OCP policy statements on that. Next slide, please. Fire risk management uh, has certainly come up in our early engagement. It's something that we are um, very focused on as well. It's something we take uh, very seriously. Here on Bowen Island, we've got 40 years of experiencing, uh, 40 years of experience managing wildfire risk. As an organization, um, we maintain a comprehensive region-wide uh, fire management system that includes a fire condition task force through the summer and active collaboration with the province. Each of our parks has a fire preparedness and response plan and wildfire suppression equipment. Next slide, please. Regional park staff are trained in fire suppression, uh, our watershed fire protection program, which includes some of the most skilled crews in the province. We work closely with them. Initial attack crews are available 24 seven in the summer months. And of course, the best tool is prevention. The regional park bylaw is enforced by our rangers and risk is actively managed throughout the summer season. Uh, this, the proposed park would provide increased surveillance, stewardship on ma and maintenance on an area that is uh, currently uh, somewhat under the radar in that regard. Next slide, please. Um, it, generally speaking, our approach to land management is one that is focused on safety, protecting the integrity of ecosystems and adaptive management. Our staff is experienced and our approach to land management focuses on community involvement and collaboration. Next slide, please. Um, the best local example of this is of course, Crippen Regional Park. It is so integrated with the community that many people don't actually realize the natural areas and trail network that extends from Snug Cove up to and around Killarney Park and said to Dorman Point is owned, operated and maintained by Metro Vancouver. As Mike said, the majority of visitors to this park are uh, from Bowen Island. The park includes some of the most well-loved spots on the island, Drummond Point, Killarney Lake, Davies Orchard, the Causeway, Bridal Falls, the Memorial Garden, the Hatchery. And these are all landscapes and facilities we've worked with the community on over the decades with a talented staff team actually from the island. Um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Amanda to speak about the engagement process and next steps. Chair. Uh, so I'll start by kind of giving you a sense of our big concept for engagement and then talk about some of the specifics for what we would like to what we will be doing for the first phase of engagement here. So Metro Vancouver does have a pretty rigorous public engagement policy and our team is very dedicated to making sure that not only are we hearing and considering input from the communities that are impacted and that we're interested in having involved. Uh, or who may have an interest that we don't know about. So we want to make sure that people are speaking up, but also that we are reflecting back both what we've heard and what we've done with what we have heard. So how we've considered the different types of feedback. Um, we are doing a three phase engagement process for this program. So both Mike and Jeff mentioned that we just started our phase, first phase of engagement. And in each phase of engagement, we're looking for, uh, we're looking to provide a really diverse engagement opportunities. So ways that people can provide information online, in person, have conversations with staff, um, attend things virtually. We want people to be able to have the conversations that they wanna have. And at the end of each of these phases, we do an engagement summary and a report out as well. So in that we very clearly try to indicate, here's what we heard from the community and here's what we've done with that information. Here's how our plans have evolved as a result of what we've heard. Um, would certainly like to extend my thanks to the community already because we have been able to hear so much already because of the different um, emails that have come in, feedback that has been shared with us. And that's even helped us inform how we can try to create a better first phase of engagement and help facilitate the kinds of conversations that um, I think need to have, we need to have as part of developing the, the proposed part. And you would see that same process go through each of these three phases, us bringing back the new development for conversation until we get to that final concept. Uh, next slide. So specifically for this first phase of engagement, and you could expect each of the phases to be something similar, but we would adapt based on how this phase goes, what we hear. We've got two public open houses taking place, one next Saturday, March 4th, and then the following Wednesday, March 8th. 
So that's an opportunity for the community to come speak with staff in person. The three of us will be there. Several of our other subject matter experts will be there. Um, and it's really nice for us to be able to um, touch base with people uh, firsthand, have those conversations, hear the concerns, hear the opportunities. Similarly, we've got two webinars, so people can come in virtually from anywhere in the region, or this is also a way that we try to make it accessible for people who may not be able to get to a location by a certain time because of work or other constrictions. Um, we have the online feedback form, which we definitely encourage people to take part in. It's That is the place really where we can capture everyone's thoughts and comments and knowledge, and then we've got it all written down and we can make sure that we're uh, considering that as a part of our development. And then we will be doing additional types of conversations with specific groups. So there's a technical group that we're convening to be able to learn. It's more biodiversity kind of related. Um, so really being able to get into some of the more technical things that uh, folks who know this space will be able to share more information with us. That's it for me. That's over to you for final slide. Great. Um, so I think I'll wrap things up. Um, in summary, uh, we are here today to seek um, advancement of a rezoning application to permit overnight use on 97 hectares located at Cape Roger Curtis that Metro Vancouver has a conditional offer to purchase on at this time. Uh, we believe this is an amazing waterfront viewscape. We've talked about the reasons why this habitat needs to be protected and preserved for the future. Our goal is to balance protection and connection, and both are equally important to us when we're entering into a planning process, protection and connection. We're not just a conservation service. We want to make sure that we have balanced protection and balanced connection uh, to all of the landscapes we manage across our system. And of course, we look forward to working with the Bowen community and listening and learning as we go along through this process. Um, Mayor Leonard, members of council, thank you for your time today. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So folks, this is probably a good time to mention just um, during council meetings, during presentations and public comments, uh, we would ask no applause, no cheering, um, just for the reason that um, different people have different opinions. We wanna create a safe space for everybody to be able to express those opinions uh, without fear that they're um, sitting on one side or the, or the other. So we'll um, keep this as um, quiet, as the snow outside, if you possibly can. Okay. Um, so, Council, I will open it up for questions just with a note that I believe um, a very important aspect of this meeting is going to be to get to uh, public comments and the question and answer at 1.35 um, because there is a lot of them, and I'm sure folks are online or here in the middle of their day, and I would just like to respect their time. Um, if we run out of time for questions or comments, uh, we can have them at the end of the public comments. We can come back um, for council question comments after that. If council's amenable to that, so we'll go for about 10 minutes and then see the, uh, uh, hear the planning presentation. But objection? Great. Uh, so I open up the floor to Councillor Saunders. Thanks. Appreciate the presentation. Thanks very much for that. Um, on slides 11 and 12, you outlined the, uh, the overall goals and objectives of, of what you do, basically, which are all admirable goals, and I think everybody would agree like this would be great. Um, but when I was looking at those, about well, the land acquisition, why here, why now, protecting the environment, and a number of things you said, which were all great, um, there wasn't one of those that spoke specifically to overnight camping that I saw there why that would be critical to meet those major objectives of your organization. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, like, how, how do we kind of man, meld that into what we're talking about here? Sure, through the chair uh, to Councillor Saunders. I think I spoke very clearly about the, the protect and connect and that we don't do one or the other, we're always doing both at the same time. So if those slides didn't address it, I want to be very clear that that balance of protection and connection is what we do with every initiative that we enter into. And this site, as we said um, through our presentation, I think presents that amazing balance of the two with the previously disturbed portions and the amazing environmentally sensitive ecosystem that exists that can be protected. We believe that there's balance there. So we believe that it's integral. So while those two slides might not have addressed it, it is, I think, key to our whole 
um, uh, reason for wanting to provide public access to the site and to share it with the residents of the region, the 2.8 million residents that, that we represent. Uh, Councilor Wake, just as, as a reminder to um, uh, refer things through the chair. Uh, through the chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I want to speak, follow up on connection and protection because I think that gets the core of the issue that we as a council are struggling with. And both on behalf of Bull and Islanders, I think you'll hear more about that today. But um, part of balancing, as you say, connection and protection is going to be to make sure that overnight use doesn't overstep uh, the protection side of things. And you've acknowledged that there's going to be, you know, a lot of questions and you don't have all the answers now. Uh, and I guess that brings me to when will you have those answers and how are you going to get those answers without, uh, I think you want to get them through engagement, but your engagement process takes you right through to the end of this year uh, before you're going to be able to have a final plan, presumably with all those answers. Uh, and yet, um, I understand it, right? We're being asked to make a decision uh, much sooner than that. And uh, to me, those two things are in conflict. Thank you, and I guess to the chair, uh, if I, I do understand your question with respect to the timeline of the process, we believe that the timeline has sort of two very significant components. One is the rezoning process, which is a land use decision. And yes, the actual park plan and designing process will exceed that time frame, and that that's very typical. Um, that record needs to know that it's securing property that it can actually ultimately have the land use on, and then at that time, through the full sim engagement process that we've detailed today, that level of balance, that protection and connection can be determined, and that's the engagement process that we look forward to working with you and the community on. We believe that that process has been initiated. Uh, we've been talking to your municipality for some time, um, for almost a year now, as well at, at, at the staff level, uh, and we are hearing the concerns as they come up, and we hope to address them over time. Today, we're introducing the topic, we're frustrating, and we also understand from your planning staff and the report that you will be hearing directly after this, that this will be referred to your committees, and that's where we expect that rich feedback to come back, and it's at that time, Councillor, when those answers through the chair will be answered. Thank you. Councillor Fast. Um, thank you very much. Uh, through the chair, my question is uh, in reference to the traffic and access study that you mentioned, that it's underway, and uh, I'm wondering when we can expect that, because that has so much bearing uh, in our limited um, infrastructure and systems that we have in our community um, uh, to, on, on the, has a lot of bearing on whether the community would decide about camping. Um, because the camping idea is similar to ones that the community has grappled with in the past, such as should we have a hotel? Currently, there's no hotel in the OCP, partly because of these similar kinds of reasons, I believe. Meanwhile, uh, you know, I don't want to go on a big, long talk, but we do need an alternative. I think more and more people are coming, whether or not there's a park there and uh, whether or not. Uh, and I would like to invite people coming to Bowen to come without a car. So I'm interested in this traffic and access study. Do you have... Um, any information about when we might have that? Uh, through the chair, uh, yes, it's underway and we hope to have it uh, a, a draft for discussion in, in about a month's time, I would say. And to your other comments, and certainly it's our goal as well to really focus on yarn, on uh, car access to the park. So ideas like uh, a park shuttle bus and providing, working with the municipality to make greenway connections to the park would be um, um, prioritized. Councillor Jurgensen. Two access questions. One is regarding the 35 uh, car sites. I understand the need for accessibility in that. Anybody who 
knows me knows that, but it seems a bit much to have a whole full third of those be car access. And I just wonder how that number was arrived at. Um, uh, through the chair, uh, the preliminary land use plan shows, as um, Councilor Jackson, you've, you've identified up to 35 drive-in sites. We believe that it was a balanced approach to the four types of camping choice that we were providing um, in this park council plan. The one being the uh, yurt or tent mix is a, a branded term that I think Parks Canada uses. Um, one is drive-in. Uh, and one is um, for walk-in, and sorry, I guess the fifth one would be the potential for group camping. Uh, as Jeff said when he was talking about the diversity of camping experiences, um, some people from an accessibility point of view do want to have that ability to choose um, to bring their family uh, to, to the campsite. The site that we'd identified on our concept plan has been previously disturbed. Actually, it's been completely logged 100%. Um, and we felt that that was a suitable um, choice. Um, and of course, through the feedback process, we look forward to feedback on the concept plan. Um, uh, with respect to access, those are the most popular um, campsites that we know uh, across the region that when the availability for them comes up each year between May and October. And in the many other campsites, we manage many campgrounds now across the region. Um, when they become available, any of you who are campers, you know as soon as they're on the books four months ahead of time, they're, they're, they're essentially booked up these days. And that's really fulfilling a regional need. And that's why we, we included that number in the mix. With respect to group campgrounds, um, we manage, I'm not sure how many we manage across the region because there's, there's many. Um, the group campgrounds are very interesting because many times they actually just sit vacant. But when groups come, uh, they're you know, Girl Guides, Boy Scouts, church groups, um, they use the site, uh, they come in and they come out, and it's typically on weekends and during the week, and particularly in the winter months, nobody uses them. The, 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 the level of utilization is very low. And I think Jeff referenced that in his, his slide as well, that we'd be happy to walk you through again. Um, uh, with respect to the walk-in campsites, we believe that that's a low impact opportunity that would require bus or shuttle for access only. Uh, speaking to the, the transportation piece there, and our, uh, uh, there's a good example of that, I believe, on Salt Spring Island at a campground called Ruckle, which is a very similar type of experience that already exists that many people may be familiar with. And the site, again, the previously disturbed areas, lends itself to that um, sort of low impact opportunity. So really, the landscape helped to drive it, but also did what we believe is the market need for campgrounds. Okay, in that case, uh, because it's being sold as an accessibility concession, is there a way for Metro Vancouver to be ensuring that the priority for that is given to people who have accessibility challenges? Or is that being just offered just as an alternative? You bring your car and then those spots get taken up um, as by anyone. Um, through the chair, the, the detailed program is yet to be developed, but that's excellent feedback that we can take away. Uh, when we're looking at our program plan. Um, one of the leading practices that we know the province, BC Parks and private campgrounds utilize is that they do identify accessible only sites. Uh, and that uh, we are also proposing a 100% reservation system for any campground, similar to our, all of our other campgrounds across the region, um, that you could actually um, put that designation in on specific spots. So thank you for that suggestion. Through the, through the chair, my final question is about, uh, it was shared with us that there's potential for water taxi service to Cape Rock Curtis. And is there any more information that you're able to provide on how that might be provided and accomplished? Um, through the chair, uh, we have heard from Bowen staff that there is interest in the market for that. And at this time, I have no other information on that. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions just regarding the visitation numbers. Um, so we know that overnight visitation is also different than day use visitation. So I think based upon the um, regional parks report, the only other sort of comparable site is, is Derby Reach, which I believe in 2021 saw 155,000 overnight visitors, but the day use visitors was logged as closer to 1.3 million. So I'm curious about what the projection is for day use 
of the park um, and whether that factors into transportation management, transit issues, and uh, accessibility. Through the chair, we know that approximately 304,000 um, people come to Crippen Regional Park each year. We believe that the actual number of people coming to Bowen Island to go to Crippen or that site would be incremental. And today, I can't give you a number for that. Um, it's a bit of an unfair comparison, Mayor Leonard, looking mm -hmm. at Derby, given it's yes. an urban area where we've got 2.8 million residents on the doorstep there and they don't have to take a ferry uh, to get there. One of our mitigation measures that we're proposing is 100% reservation, much as like BC Parks has undertaken in other campsites as well. So if you are um, hoping to come to Crippen, you can come to Crippen. If you're hoping to come to Crippen and have that ticket to be able to experience the Cape, then that would be through a reservation system. So that's a way for us to um, manage balanced access to the site. Um, and uh, that's actually what it was in our presentation today. Thank you. And the last question I have is just around the notion of phased open. Curious whether you can give or provide any details as to um, what that would actually look like as it unfolds. Jeff, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, I think um, I think through through the planning process, we'll get we'll understand what that would look like in a more detailed way. But we take a precaution. We Take a precautionary approach in regional parks and that we 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 move forward in a way that allows us to adapt and learn as we go so specific to the camping pro program that's part of the rezoning application you can imagine imagine in the initial years it would be you know a pilot to test the, the pro the um a number of different campsites along with the shuttle ensure that's functioning well ensure the communication is working good the, the reservation system, and we can adapt as we go before we take the next phase and expand that. So um, that's the idea in principle. I think in terms of how it looks over time, uh, we'll get into those details as we move through that. Through the process. Thank you. So would the intent be to have 100 campsites open at the start of the park, or, or is it? Well, I think, I think by, it, uh, by taking a, a phased approach, it would it would happen over time. That would be kind of a build out um, a build out piece. So again, we would um, you know put a number in place, test the demand, test the reservation system, the you know the access, ensure ensure all these pieces are working. And as we move forward, um, we we improve and and uh, make sure everything is working as as originally intended. Okay. So if I understand correctly, there would be uh, two build out over time and, and assess the impacts of things like transportation and shuttle over time uh, instead of going for 100 campsites right at the outset. Exactly. Thank you. And um, through the chair, my letter today, we're seeking permission for overnight use um, on the site. And um, that that's what's key. Um, the, as Jeff said, planning for the phased implementation over time will be balanced as we do with all of our development. Thank you. Um, so we'll end the question period uh, there. Thank you very much for the presentation, Mr. Redpath, Mr. Fitzpatrick, and Ms. Uh, McKay. And I would um, now turn it over to our manager of planning um, for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Leonard. So I have a, a short presentation to introduce this application. Some of the material in the presentation you will um, heard just previously, so I may skim over some elements of it. And um, yeah, and obviously there's more details in my staff report that's available on our agenda. But as you are you are um, very well aware, I'm here today to introduce a, an application to amend the. Excuse me. It's very very difficult to hear you. Okay. Is there a way that you could speak up? No. <laughs> um, we are here today for an introduction of a rezoning application and an amendment to the OCP for a proposed regional park at Cape Roger Curtis. Um, the proposal is to rezone the property or the 24 properties to a park zone 
um, with a zone variation to over a portion of the site to permit supervised overnight use of up to 100 campsites. And then so you see the proposal before you, the range of campsites that are shown, the walk, bike, and the group tent camping, the car accessible tent camping, and the tent cabin. So shown in that site plan. Um, in terms of what the, the land currently is designated for in our official community plan, it's designated as our rural. Um, and I'll go over some more of the policies later in this presentation. Um, and in terms of zoning, this site is zoned rural residential one. Um, so that's our sort of most basic rural zoning. The zone would permit one dwelling and one accessory dwelling use on each lot. So um, a total of 48 dwellings could be built over the 24 lots. Um, when we're considering overnight use, the, the zone does permit residential guest accommodation as an accessory use of the permitted dwelling. So um, absent a rezoning, um, the site could be developed so that there are short-term rentals available on the two dwellings on the lot. Um, the zone permits bed and breakfast use as a home occupation and lots of this size would be permitted up to five bed and breakfast rooms as part of a home occupation. Um, and then not specific to this zone, but the land use bylaw has a section that per says uses permitted in all zones. And so permitted in all zones are bicycle paths, equestrian trails, pedestrian trails or boardwalks, educational interpretive signage, open space and natural parks. Um, so you'll see in the report that I sort of synthesize this as saying, um, the regional park use absent the overnight use would be permitted um, in terms of if you're imagining a regional park that looks like sort of Crippen Park around Killarney Lake um, with trails and signage um, is a permitted use in this zone. And in fact, many municipal parks exist in under this provision of, of trails and signage. Um, I'm not going to read all of these um, policies, but for Council's knowledge, these are an overview that's from the report. So there's policies governing the rural designation. Um, and I've highlighted four of the objectives of that designation. Um, there's two policies specific to campgrounds. Um, just to highlight, so the policy 189 says campgrounds for recreational vehicles and trailer parks shall not be permitted. Um, and as you've heard, that's not part of the, the proposed application. Um, and then policy 190 talks about campgrounds serving the needs of backpackers and bicyclists may be permitted through commercial zoning regulations and has some things to consider as part of that. And so as part of this application and part of this OCP amendment, it would be amending these policies for the discussion for drive-in campsites as well. Um, and this one is, is much harder to read, especially in the back, but it's, it's found in the report. And these are just policies that are in the OCP specific to Cape Roger Curtis for objectives and policies. So objective 40 is to encourage retention of portions of CRC in its natural state accessible to the public. All right, and then our CFO has prepared um, additional information on financial implications that wasn't included in the staff report, but we will update the staff report to include it. And this is her analysis based on um, the assessed value of the 24 lots, the potential build out of the 24 lots if they were developed as residential lots, um, what the assessed value would be, so what their contribution to the municipal tax base would be. Um, so she estimates it would be about 2.8% of the property taxes collected would come from these 24 lots. Um, so the, the rezoning to um, become a park would instead be shifting that tax burden to the remaining properties on Bowen Island. And that would be um, weighed in balance, I think, in terms of implications on the financial, the municipal financial situation in terms of the assets that are currently municipal assets within this park system that would be then maintained by uh, Metro Vancouver, such as the trails that already exist in, through the park. Um, and then I just want to touch on the communication. So the section 475 of the Local Government Act relates to when a council, when a local government considers amendments to an OCP, it says the local government needs to provide one or more opportunities it considers appropriate for consultation with persons, organizations, and authorities it considers will be affected. Um, so this leaves sort of latitude for the local government to consider and specify who, at who and what the consultation should take place. And obviously it, it leaves that space for council to, to know how large a, an application is before them and so what level of consultation is needed. Um, but in terms of the initial engagement, this is from our municipal website. Um, and I understand it's, it's challenging to read this, but just in terms of where we are in this initial engagement process, um, the orange is showing the municipality process, so February 27th, application introduced to council, so there we are today. Um, in the blue, that Metro Vancouver has a series of engagement opportunities that we would invite everyone to visit our website and Metro Vancouver website 
um, for the public open houses, the webinars. They also have an online feedback form. I would encourage people to fill out. Um, and what we've put on this um, timeline that is sort of for council's discussion is returning results of those referrals in April to council. Um, and then the report also talks about just the overall rezoning process and sort of pointing out the steps that are required in a rezoning, um, in any rezoning, any OCP amendment. These are sort of steps that need to happen. And so they're, they're touch points of when this would be coming to council. So we're introducing the application. We would be coming back with the results of those initial referrals to council. Council would be considering first reading, doing further engagement, considering second reading. After second reading, council would need to hold a public hearing before consideration of third reading, approval of the Islands Trust for an OCP amendment bylaw, and then consideration of fourth reading. And I sometimes when I'm explaining this to people, refer to it almost as like an accordion and that these are the points that need to take place, but but depending on the process, it can it can stretch longer or be, or be more compressed, but it's like these points would need to be hit in any process. Um, and then I have a recommendation here that I understand council will be discussing later in the meeting, so I won't speak to it, but just that idea of, of council determines who should be consulted and what should be appropriate consultation. So staff have recommended um, committees and agencies to refer to, but council will can deliberate and decide the appropriate consultation. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Uh, any questions from council for the matter? Seeing none, we will be moving on to the public uh, comment and question and answer portion of the meeting. If there are members of the public here who would like to sign up for a, a question or comment who haven't already, uh, our corporate officer is just grabbing the clipboard at the back and we'll do a last call. <laughs> and is there anything that you need from people online who wish to speak or is that already? Uh, they're, they're all pre-registered. They're all pre-registered, okay. Um, and so, so some of the questions will likely come to the Metro Parks team. Uh, ways that we want to organize the room, or, or you folks want to come up and have a seat? Are you okay answering if we refer questions to you from there? I think um, I'd like to go back up to the first class seats there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. So maybe just move them to the side. So when people do. Uh, uh, ask a question, they'll be coming to this, this center seat at, here at the table. So perhaps you could uh, organize yourself on your other side of uh, Councillor Jurgensen and Councillor Saunders. Sure. Is this okay where we are? Uh, Councillor Fess? Can I just say uh, a CO2 meter has touched up into the red, gone down into the yellow. You might want to open the windows a bit more. Thank you. If you're concerned about it. It's an indicator of how much of each other's air we're breathing. <laughs> We have Bob Turner on Zoom. Okay, so just a, a couple of comments on how this will be handled. So we're uh, each member of the public, you have up to three minutes. Um, and this is kind of a combination of what we would do at a regular council meeting where we'd have the public comments at the start and the Q&A at the end. We've meshed them together. So you are free as a member of the public um, to use that three minutes however you like. If, you, if you're just here to make a comment, we're totally here and uh, open to hear it. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, um, please ask it to myself as the chair and I'll direct it. I'll air traffic control it to the, <laughs> to the appropriate person. Um, and you have three minutes as well. Uh, our corporate officer sets a timer for two minutes and 50 seconds. So it will go off at 10 seconds before your time has ended to give you time or give the speaker time to uh, finish up the thought um, and get their uh, uh, last point out. Sounds good? Getting some nods in the audience. This is always like nervous part of like, ooh, what are we gonna get? <laughs> um, so who is uh, up first, Bob Turner? Our uh, first card is Bob Turner, yep. All right, Mr. Turner. Hi there, Mayor and Council. I got to shove a th five minute conversation into three minutes. So here we go. Um, my intention is not to voice an opinion, yes or no, on the proposal, but rather just to speak to some of my hopes and particularly um, my hopes for the three key players, Metro, Bowen, uh, Council and staff in the community. My first hope 
you know, for Metro is that you um, uh, can, you know, consider whether your consultation process as you have outlined it right now is really serving your purpose given how fast you're trying to proceed to your rezoning proposal. Um, and I'd also ask, I, I would hope that you would look out generations and weigh more heavily your strategic considerations regarding the conservation values of the land versus the potential recreation opportunities, because I just don't see a replacement for the conservation values of these lands in any other landscape in the region. Um, and sort of a third point is that I really ask that you dig deep and try and see life from the point of view of a small community that just wants to stay small, has a very fragile transportation infrastructure um, that'll never be big. Um, because keeping Bowen a small community is a, an incredible asset to the region where small communities are few. And like Lions Bay, Belcara and more, we bring a unique perspective to the region and to the experience of region's residents just as we are, just as things are now. My hope for council is that you can act to the best of your abilities to ensure that Metro Vancouver meets the engagement needs of Bowen Islanders, and you hold considerable power in asserting quality control on the whole process. At some point in the future, you're gonna to have to decide whether you are going to receive the rezoning application or reject it as not ready for first reading. And so it's important that Bowen Island um, municipal staff signal early to Metro staff their expectations for what they're willing to accept and recommend to council for first reading. To the community, you know, I really hope that we're recognizing that we're staring at a once in a generation opportunity to create a significant new parkland on Bowen Island. And so, Islanders, we have a collective responsibility to our community and to the present and future members of our community to be good stewards of this decision. So we need to show up as best we can, listen well, weigh the pros and cons, be on the good lookout for good ideas, never knowing where a new idea is going to pivot the conversation into a more productive um, direction. I'll just pass on two things I learned early on. Um, one was at a rookie school for elected officials back in 2000. I'll never forget the land use planner telling us, he said, mark my words, you will spend a disproportionate amount of your time on land use planning issues relative to the budget you allocate to it. Because that it's because land use uh, decision-making has to imagine the future. And so it plays to both hopes and fears. And those are different in every person. And I think it's really important for us you, to- you, you're, you're at time, Mr. Turner. Okay. In other words, I'll finish up with just saying, let's all respect the fact that we are, um, it's humbling to realize that we're all just guessing about the future. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Former Mayor Turner. It's always a pleasure to have you back here, your presence in the council chambers. Very appreciate it. Okay, thanks. I uh, like to build a bit on what Bob said. I really agree with those, those points that he made. So I, I wrote a letter. It's a bit long. Um, I, I sent it in. I guess it's on the um, uh, the late agenda. Um, so I squashed it down to three minutes, and I'm going to read from it so I can keep it to that uh, at least. So, um, <clears throat> Mayor and Council, members of the public, I will speak to four areas. Infrastructure, camping, seven generations, and Bowen's role. So infrastructure. Many islanders have expressed valid concerns that Bowen's infrastructure could be overwhelmed by the influx of cars and people and obviously the ferry. It's not that the park will cause the ferry to become a problem. As we saw last summer, it already is. So we can use the park as an opportunity to fix it. Council has long called for foot passenger service to take commuters directly downtown. But with one-way traffic, it's not been viable. At the park, this could fundamentally change with commuters going one way and visitors the other. With two-way traffic, this long call for solution could be feasible at last, potentially making transportation better, not worse. Let's work with Metro to make this happen. Camping. Some islanders have said no camping, but my conversations with mayors and councillors around the region last year found that this wouldn't meet the needs of their residents. Here's why. Metro Vancouver has a growth boundary to protect environmentally sensitive lands, yet the population grows by 30 to 40,000 annually. So Metro Vancouver is densifying, building up rather than out, and more families are living in apartments without easy access to nature. So people are asking their mayors for more parks and particularly for overnight camping. That's why directors from across the 22 other local governments agreed to have their taxpayers 
pay their share $40 million so their residents could have that iconic West Hill camping experience, a short journey from trans and trip away. But let's work on what type of camping, how much, how do we protect fragile areas, phase it in, as we heard, and so on. Seven generations. Land use decisions, as Bob said, are forever. Once this land becomes 24 estates, it will never be available for public recreation and the natural landscapes will be cut into chunks vulnerable to the changing climate. We're making a decision here, not just for ourselves, but for generations to come. Think of the parks across the region, how our lives would be diminished if it weren't for the foresight of earlier leaders to set aside land for development. So we need to make this decision with, as First Nations say, seven generations in mind. What will our children's children be needing in a climate stressed world? I think it will be forests and rare species and a place to appreciate the beauty of nature rather than 24 private estates. Finally, Bowen's role in the region. Around a thousand cars daily leave Bowen to use the mainland, shopping, jobs, education, and so on. And we contribute to the region's congestion and pollution. Clearly, we need and use a region. What can we give back? UN biosphere designation, Bowen's brand, and Metro Vancouver's regional plans all point to our connection with nature. Metro Vancouver's plans highlight our conservation and recreation role. To me, we are a green oasis. I'll be real quick. Green oasis where we protect as best we can our natural, unique env environment, where we share it with others who also respect nature and agree to tread carefully, and where we can provide environmental education for young people and others who want to learn. So let's listen carefully, as Bob said, learn from each other, work together to address today's issues and find seven generation solutions that meet Bowen and Metro Vancouver's needs and give us all a wonderful regional park. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Hawking. Charles McNeil. Good afternoon. I first came to Bowen in 1954, and this is my first time speaking to council. My message is simple. I'm in favor of placing these 240 acres of precious land at the Cape into the public domain as a park, and I'm also committed to doing it in a way that protects the special quality of life on Bowen. Why am I so enthusiastic about this park? Some of us, like my family, thanks to my grandparents who came here 107 years ago in 1916, have waterfront property and full-time access to the ocean and forest. My life has been immensely enriched by this. In fact, this connection with the natural world, including my favorite garter snakes, inspired my entire career at the United Nations, where I had the privilege to focus on protecting tropical forests and addressing climate change around the world for the past 30 years. I am motivated by my strong desire for everyone on Bowen and other municipalities too, especially our children, to have full access to the remarkable ocean and forest of the Cape. I believe this park opens, uh, offers great value. It provides 240 acres that connect to the 32 acres of the Wild Coast Nature Reserve. Refuge, and it connects to the 44 acres of the Ferry Fan Nature Reserve and possibly extensive areas of crown land. This will protect a significant landscape that, in my business, I think it can help us do our part towards addressing the dual global crises of biodiversity loss and climate change. What do we lose without a park? Without a park, this will be in the hands of a few private owners and will not be able, we will not be able to protect this precious ecosystem. Without a park, there will be extensive development by my reading, up to 48,438 square feet per lot with significant alteration and degradation of land. We've already seen this in phase one of the development. Without a park, we won't have access into the future up to this privately held land other than a few trails that run along property lines. And significantly, we will certainly not have access to that spectacular 900 meters of coastland. I believe that we are extremely fortunate that Metro Vancouver is willing to invest in a park. In my experience with biodiversity conservation all over the world, communities almost always need to raise their own funds for parks through difficult and long fundraising campaigns. Let's take advantage of this unusual official situation. I've always been impressed by Bowen Islanders' commitment to environmental sustainability. We've been early movers and leaders for many years in recycling and composting, a track record that I've seen puts New York City to shame. We've done a lot for forest and ocean protection, sustainability planning, regenerative agriculture, and so on. Now we have the UNESCO bio biosphere uh, region designation. And whenever I visit parks around the world, I always wonder what group of people had the foresight and generosity to establish that park. I want us to be that group. I want Bowen to continue our tradition of sustainability and leadership through inclusive consultations that lead to a pathway to protect this land while we just as carefully protect Bowen's precious quality of life. And to conclude, 
What I believe is most important and urgent now is to get this precious land into the public domain to avoid the inevitable process of development, degradation, and exclusion. We only have this one chance to get it right. I believe we owe it to ourselves and our future generations. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Elliott. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Fraser. I moved to White Hills Drive when I was two years old. I still live there. Let me paint a picture about what my street has experienced in the past couple of decades. This is not because I'm pining for some long lost past, but it's because it's important to recognize what has happened in this neighborhood and how traffic in Tunstall has become dangerous over the past few years. The White Sails of my childhood was my playground where I learned to ride my bike and skateboard and where I felt safe to do so. Cape Roger Curtis was subsequently purchased and developed, and at that time we raised concerns as a neighborhood about traffic and access. We knew then that the construction of 59 Estates would lead to fundamental change of our neighborhood driven by this increase in traffic, and that is exactly what has happened. We are now in a situation with an unsustainable and dangerous level of traffic, both in terms of volume and speed, that our streets and our neighborhood was not designed for. We are by far the densest residential neighborhood that passers-by go through between the ferry and the Cape. There are a huge number of young families with kids there, and those kids walk to their school bus stops at the exact same time. The mostly off-island construction vehicles race down our streets to and from the ferry and work with a well-documented disregard for our speed limit. Because of this, and combined with the Bowen, with Bowen's increased level of tourism, we as a neighborhood have experienced a large number of incidents over the past few years, which I can't get into in detail because of the time period, but I'm going to mention one, and it included today, Metro Vancouver vehicles racing down our streets and I have license plate numbers and photographs to support this. All of this supports a clear picture that there's a disconnect between those using our roads and those who live here. There's a lack of respect and no fear of accountability. And because of this, I formed the Tunstall Bay Neighborhood Group recently to work with the RCAP to address this. We have a traffic problem now, which undoubtedly will only get worse with a parking campsites. And this needs to be addressed prior to any consideration of a park proposal. Properly addressing this problem should involve an independent and public traffic impact study, and that study should guide the design of the park proposal from day one. That should not be happening in parallel with an application, but in advance, so that it informs what the application looks like, what the design of the park looks like, and the number of campsites, if any, that are sustainable for an island of our size and character. And this community engagement should also be happening prior to non-parallel this application. Anything else is premature. To Metro, I sincerely thank you for being here and thank you for recognizing how special our island is and wanting to help us protect a significant portion of it. I think we all agree that that is something that we all want and need. I also urge you to read letters written by Erica Olson and Steph Olson-Jones to my um, neighbors for some amazing stuff to add into this. I would also like to extend you the invitation to meet with members of my neighborhood to hear our concerns in more detail. To council, I strongly urge you to reject the park proposal as it stands right now and ask that you respectfully request that Metro resubmit their application once the above steps are taken with a dramatic decrease in the number of campsites and alternative Cape access to the Cape via Thompson Road. I also ask you to immediately instruct Public Works to install traffic calming measures in Tunstall Bay and to consider alternative ways to coerce off island contractors to respect our speed limit, perhaps through business license suspensions or stop work orders for any properties with infractions. This needs to happen regardless of a park and it needs to happen now. My five-year-old son doesn't feel safe learning how to bike on the same road that I did growing up and I want my five-month-old son in a few years time to be able to do that safely himself. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Should you represent your neighborhood? Ellen Hello. Hi. Um, as a former wildlife biologist for over a decade and a national and provincial parks interpreter, um, and to being involved in stakeholder relations, um, I'm all for parks and I'm also all for open and transparent process. And so um, I'm here just to point out that um, you know, we, we heard an announcement um, in August about the park and that there would be overnight camping um, and that there was a conditional offer um, that was to this spring in 2023. Um, so one of, my, one of um, the things that I am, um, would like some definition on, um, not necessarily here, I've got other things to say, um, but whether the camping piece of it um, is... Um, open, I mean, we've seen less than 100 campsites listed, but what about the other, you know, 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30? I think we need some specifics on that. 
Um, and then in the report called the Regional Parks Land Acquisition Report 2050, it's clearly stated that the announcement about the acquisition is made after the transfer of title is complete. So, um, where, you know, and just as the announcement was made on August the 10th, that seems preliminary, um, the rezoning application was submitted in January before the public engagement process had officially started. So meaning that there wasn't any input from our community at that particular point in time. Um, so I feel that we in the community, as well as mayor and council, need more time to understand the impacts of a proposed regional park on nature and the downstream effects um, on our island infrastructure, as well as on the heart and soul of our community. Um, and on this note, I'm wondering whether Mayor and Council would be willing to defer consideration of the current proposed OCP amendment and proposed rezoning until um, after MVRD executes the purchase and sale um, agreement and the transfer of land is completed. That would seem to be more along with the process. Um, and I think that deferral would allow the Council to work collaboratively with um, Metro Van to develop a more meaningful, informed, and inclusive engagement process with um, Skohomish Nation and our community while facilitating the exploration of other possible scenarios for a regional park that may better serve the protection um, and regeneration, regeneration of nature and the well-being of people in this region um, and on our island, and uh, most importantly also for the seven generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Melanie McCready, and she was going to join us by Zoom. Uh, Melanie, I don't see your name in the list. If your name does something else, then please um, unmute yourself. Or maybe she is not here. So I will uh, Margaret Underhill on Zoom. Hello, um, I'd like to talk about the campground issue. Um, Metro Parks has stated they have extensive history with campgrounds. Some perspective on this statement might be helpful. A quick online search of Metro Vancouver Regional Park shows six regional parks that provide campgrounds. One park, Derby Reach and Langley has 38 unserviced campsites with overnight camping from March 1st to October 31st no maximum number of campers is stated. Capilano River Park on the North Shore has indoor camping only with a maximum of 44 overnight campers. Three parks in Langley, Surrey and Delta offer overnight camping for a maximum of 40 campers at each park. Bray Island Park in Langley offers overnight camping but this campground is evidently operated by a third party with a total of 156 sites plus five tent cabins. No maximum number of campers is stated. The total number of overnight campers in campgrounds actually operated by Metro Parks, so excluding the Bray Island Park, is considerably less than one half of the number of campers um, contemplated for the Cape Roger Curtis Park. And interestingly, the outdoor camping sites charge $114 plus GST, of course, per night for youth groups, and $229 plus GST a night for adult family groups. The concept of protecting the undeveloped part of Cape Roger Curtis as green, as green space is positive. However, my husband and I share the concerns about the impact of camping on the risk of wildfires, existing emergency services, transit, inadequate ferry service, and a deteriorating road infra infrastructure. Rezoning to allow camping would substantially increase these negative impacts. It should not happen. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Underhill. And Zoe Christina Harris. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Zoe Christina Solares, and along with my family, I'm currently under contract to purchase one of the remaining lots at the Cape, um, just outside the boundary of the proposed park. In my professional capacity as a spiritual mentor with advanced professional degrees, so not from a cereal box or from one ayahuasca trip, um, my work is to assist people in positions of leadership when they hit a wall. Invariably, I find that the name of that wall is something we call root loss. 
As a colonized society, we have at some point in our history lost our connection to our own ancestral lands and settled here on this gem of an island in the Salish Sea, and we feel strongly about protecting it. But there is a stark difference between the strong overtones of keeping it for ourselves, which I have unfortunately heard lots of lately, versus working to be good stewards and guests in a good way with our Indigenous hosts. The world is on the verge of large scale and irreparable ecological collapse. And this is due in a large part to our disconnection from nature. But human beings protect what they love. How can we protect nature if we've lost our connection with her? What we have failed to consider or that I have not yet heard except from Councillor Sewell and Fast in her election comments on her podcast is that the land itself has personhood. We so often think we know best what the land wants and needs, but we haven't actually stopped to listen to our own voice. In the last year of ceremony that I've conducted on the land at the Cape, both on my own and with substantial groups of others, the one thing we have consistently and very loudly heard from the voice of the land itself when stripped of all agendas or ideas is that the land deeply desires to be in communion with its people. It wants its people to come back to the forest and to sleep on the earth which is one of the single most effective ways of resynchronizing your simple human animal body with the pulse and heartbeat of the land. A 20 minute walk with a dog or a hike for an hour a few times a year is hopelessly inadequate for a deep reconnection. Our connection in, with nature is in crisis and in need of repair. Are we so invested in keeping stolen land to ourselves that we, co we recoil at city folk desperate for reconnection to nature? or to limit it to short visits. Additionally, I would never attempt to speak for or say that I represent any indigenous nation or group. I will, however, share what I have heard from my indigenous friends, colleagues, and mentors, including from one of our host nations, seeing as they are omitted from these critical spaces in many instances. Their feedback on camping in the Cape has been as follows. Will there be a fire ban? Will vehicle access be limited? Will artificial light be limited? And if these criteria are met, then full blessings. In light of the potential legacy that we have here possible to us to create a contiguous zone of protected land, not just this proposed park, but Fairy Fen, the conservancy, and then expanding to 500 plus acres of loggable crown land, there is an enormous possibility here for something far greater than this small question of whether we human animals get to sleep on the earth and in the strongest possible terms i ask you to please approve camping at the cape thank you thank you Ms. first Ms. russell the time it takes me to get there that's not counting. <laughs> thank you council thank you uh metro vancouver my name is bruce russell uh i'm an 80 year full-time and part-time resident on the island. Uh, my conditional support uh, for the proposal uh, was indicated in my January 13th letter to council. I have some major concerns. They've been expressed already, but I'm gonna repeat them. One is the traffic on the island, uh, the transportation to and from the island. I think those are two very major, major uh, issues of concern. Uh, I didn't hear any uh, satisfactory answers today. I didn't expect it. I think that'll come through your work parties, uh, but uh, I don't think we're looking for Band-Aid solutions. We're looking for major surgery uh, in that respect. I didn't hear much about the property tax implications to this. I heard some reference from Daniel, but uh, I'd like to know the quantum, forget about all the fluff that goes around, da, 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 but what is the net tax position to the community for giving up the 24 acres? I'm not concerned about giving up, not the 24 acres, 24 lots, pardon me. Uh, but I'd like to know what the tax implications are that. Is, a, is that a, a loss of a few dollars or a whole bunch of dollars? Because I think that's part and parcel of the decision. I'm not suggesting for a minute, dollars should necessarily stop the park. But I think that's a trade-off in the things that the municipality would be looking for from the uh, Metro Vancouver people. I, I don't envy the position that council's got. We've got one chance to get this right. A case in point, if perhaps the, the impacts on the quality of life in our community is substantially affected, what opportunities do we have on a second basis 
to get it right? Is there a, an avenue of opportunity to suggest to council, to, to Metro Vancouver, something isn't working. We've got to make more changes. That's very concerning to me. I've suggested to council, it be a phase one, phase two, traffic and transportation approach to the, uh, those two particular issues. I'm very much in favor of protecting the environment. I think it should be given very much uh, high priority, uh, but it can't be totally at the expense of our quality of life. Uh, so getting the right answers and solutions now is extremely important because later I think is too late. Thank you. Somebody else can use my save time. <laughs> I did notice there, there was a question there. I, we do have our CFO in the back of the room. Um, uh, Ms. Watson, did you have any numbers or did you want to speak on the tax implications of the loss of those 24 lots? I can speak on, on uh, loss of the 24 lots. We have the updated property tax values for the land uh, for the Nanari um, So the value of the actual lots on this, on this preliminary rule is just over $55 million. If we applied our last year's residential tax rate to the land value, um, that would be an immediate loss of $104,000 of property tax revenue to Bowen Island um, municipality that represents uh just over about one and a half percent of our of our total overall property tax collected and then uh, one does need to consider to the future value of the improvements that likely would go um on those lots there's eight waterfront lots which are um quite um typically quite expensive and then uh 16 interior lots so i did a quick calculation um, and estimated very conservatively of a $3 million improvement on the waterfront lots and a $1.2 million improvement on the interior lots. And then again, at that last year's tax rate, that yielded an additional $80,000 of foregone future property tax revenue. So um, overall, the council needs to consider that uh, the loss of about $185,000 per year is um is about 2.8 percent of our overall property tax collection. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Mm -hmm. uh, Jay Mather. Mr. Mather. Uh, I'm not. I saw him earlier. He may have stepped out, so maybe we'll come back. Uh, Michael Gustafson. Mr. Gustafson. To thank the council and all the members here, as well as uh, Metro Vancouver. Uh, I jotted this down, so I thought, in terms of saving time, I, I, I moved very quickly. It stands out more as a sentiment than anything else that we have here, reflecting a number of people that I've talked to that live on the island, myself included, over the last four years. Um, nobody here, and certainly not me, from a, a Marine biology background would would say that uh, protecting the environment uh, and species and maintaining species diversity isn't important. Absolutely is. But most of the talk that we've we've heard has been of that ilk, as opposed to and including how the community is is going to be impacted on, on the changes in the park. So I'd like to read a very quick. Uh, note that kind of reflects my general uh, overview. And I would also preface that by saying that there certainly needs to be an awful lot more detail in any type of plan that is, is, uh, is uh, rationally and responsibly dealt with uh, before we can come to, uh, to an understanding and, and a commitment. Um, I've been an owner and resident for the past four years, living at 987 CD Place. The reason for coming to Bowen was a desire to live in a quiet, peaceful community lifestyle woven into a spectacular natural environment. The, the uniqueness on many levels, social, community, natural environment cannot be overstated. I suggest we take a careful look at Metro Vancouver Park plan because once implemented, it'll be impossible to unwind. All of us living on Bowen Island have a duty of care to ensure responsible development consistent with community spirit, available infrastructure, 
and natural environment preservation. Sensible long-term community planning, read by majority, is of critical importance if we are to be good custodians of this wonderful bond life experience. We entrust the council to advocate those sentiments. I list a number of, of concerns needing clarification before a reasonably informed decision can be made on the pro pro project's uh, approval. Every congestion as a result of increased traffic needs uh, need to be addressed. Already we're experiencing limitations in ferry capacity. Adequate water supply at the proposed site needs to be determined for human consumption and possible uh, forest fire deployment. Managing the risk of fire mitigation it's a uh, detailed cost and procedural overview. Infrastructure impingement on road congestion, quality of road service, and detailed support for campsite needs to be studied. Who manages the project? What associated costs and how are they divided? How will policing enforcement of intended park use be conducted? What are the costs and how are they divided? These are what I see as seminal questions and concerns to be carefully considered before hastily and carelessly proceeding. I expect the whole of Bowen Island community to canvas with the details of the project and encouraged to make an informed decision based on facts as opposed to casually constructed narrative. We have a timely opportunity and responsibility to carefully endorse our island community's future with an action plan driven by local community support. I look forward to more from, from Metro. But this is just a sentiment that I think kind of reflects a, a very large part of, of the community. People have come here for specific reasons. It's that peaceful, quiet enjoyment of, of this, great, this great condition that we're so fortunate in being part of. I will remind everyone uh, that I need. You are you are out of time, Mr. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Chris Arnold Foster. Forster or Foster? Me? Forster? Forster. 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 Mr. Arnold Forster, thank you. Well, thank you, Mayor and Council. I very much appreciate your efforts. I pity you. Right at this point in time, I'm sorry. Um, that said, I came to this meeting out of a place, I come to these things out of curiosity more than anything, and I think that's a good place to be right at this particular point in time. Um, Bob Turner, if you're still on Zoom, thank you very much. Uh, welcome comments, I would echo those comments. He's thought about it, and I believe too that I don't have enough baseline information or any of us have enough baseline information to make a determination at this point about a rezoning application. That said, I fully understand that it's within the authority of this council to determine the public interest of their communities, meaning Bowen Island, under our community charter. Um, I have full confidence that this, this council will do that. Um, but I have a couple questions. Uh, First off, this is a question, and I'm not too sure who to address this to. How are regional surveys reflective of localized public interest? Maybe I will uh, send that to the Director of Communications. Sure, thank you, Chair. So when we set up our engagement, we do uh, have people indicate what part of the region they're from. And so particularly for this one, we wanted to make sure that we were able to capture what's going on for people who live on Bowen. And what are the kinds of concerns that are coming up? So the survey actually allows you to indicate if you live on Bowen full-time, part-time uh, in the summer. So we are able to then look at those comments, analyze those comments independently. And then anyone from the region can also take it. So we know what are the region-wide comments as well. And so that engagement summary will show what are we hearing from the region in terms of that appetite or interest in availability for camping, especially the way that we're proposing it in terms of that you know, taking the bus to the ferry and then coming across and taking the shuttle, what's the appetite for that? And then also what are the concerns that are coming up from residents that are specific to this community? Uh, so given that the authority to determine public interest is a localized authority, will our council have full access to the survey results and not just the survey summary? Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
Um, the second one. And, uh, sorry, I would just add that Mayor Leonard represents Bowen Council on the Metro Vancouver Board as well as on the Metro Vancouver Regional Parks Committee, and that will also be shared with that committee and Mayor Leonard by extension you that information. Right, thank you. Um, the second question I had was with relation to experience management. And uh, I'm curious as to how BC Ferries is being explicitly involved so that we can ensure that they will be exercising their authority over BC Ferries to respond to our needs. Not sure who would like to take that one up. I didn't understand the question you asked about. So oh, is the ferries being involved? Uh, I'll put it in plain terms. Um, the only people that have authority over BC Ferries are BC Ferries. They're a separate entity from government, they're a separate entity from the municipality, and they're a separate entity from uh, regional parks. But I don't see them at this table at all. We're engaged in this, nor would I see any evidence of them being even aware of this within their um, plan. So a couple of pieces to untangle there. BC Ferries does have a relationship with the province. Their performance contract is coming up um, right. later this year, which will be renegotiated. Um, we did speak to BC Ferries at their open houses at the end of the summer, um, right before the Ferry Advisory Committee meeting. And then we've also had um, a couple of meetings with them with one of our Ferry Advisory Committee uh, members, um, as well as our CAO, in relation to the ferry cancellations that we've been experiencing over the, over the last few months. And at both of those stages, uh, the indication was that they were uh, frankly surprised about this project. So from Bowen Island standpoint, um, we're unsure of that engagement and I'll, I'll hand it over to Metro Vancouver to speak to uh, their relationship to BC Ferries. Yeah. Um, yes, and through the chair, um, I think there's a couple of ways that BC Ferries will be engaged on the project. The first is through our planning work and we'll be reaching out to them. Uh, for their input on the proposal, specifically with regard to uh, the active transportation strategy to get their input, to get their, their data and their, and their feedback on that. And I believe as well through the rezoning process, I believe that the municipality will also refer it to BC Ferries and the transportation working group internally here. So there'll be a couple ways that we can do that. Um, Okay, I, I guess I would just comment that I would expect that their response would be the same as mine with regards to the application. There's simply not enough baseline information, so no comment. But I'll leave that to them. I won't put words in their mouth. You got time for one more one more question before the timer. Um, it's not a not a question, just a brief comment. Uh, it's a this is a big two way conversation and a project. This is a really big project. I hope that we make the time to do that properly and consider the process that's being used. It might not just be three gates, it might be longer than that, and I hope the full accordion can extend to the length that it can. So, thank you. Sorry for not being quite so polished, but I am very appreciative of all of our council's effort in this. Uh, I am so sorry. So. Thank you very much. And I would also add that your letter to council reflected a lot of effort and a lot of research that went into it. And it was, uh, it was appreciated and, and well received. Thank you. I am an accountant. So <laughs> you can't measure anything without me. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa Plowright. Long time, not not for generations, but you know, uh, thirty years, let's say. So um, many other speakers have already expressed the concern I'm going to focus on now, which is about the timing and the process. And as it seems that council is being asked to approve the rezoning with a real lack of information and details, also the timing for community input and public engagement. So. I'm just reiterating that it doesn't seem right that council is, is asked to be approving rezoning now. And more generally, I am still unclear after listening today, and thank you for coming. Um, I, I'm still unclear about 
the opportunity for actual dialogue where input from the council actually influences the proposed park. And just to focus on the number of campsites, um, is there any point in the process where there's an actual dialogue about a critical issue such as the number of campsites? So if, I don't know. It is is a can we go forward thinking maybe that is not a fixed number? Um, I, I have no idea really. Um, and with the phased approach, and I appreciate um, the comments that are made that it's going to be okay. We start this, and then there's a time for feedback and adjustment. But these are not things that are written down. Um, it's just kind of emerging as a conversation here. Um, as the DC ferries, this, these are really important things, um, how they are going to be consulted and where that's going to happen. Okay, and uh, one final thing I just like to mention to our Metro guests that there's also smaller issues, which may seem smaller or side issues to you, but they're quite important to us, like you know, this idea that Metro would now manage the Cape Boardwalk. Like, what is the why and the how of that? And we're, I'm also concerned about the Ferry Femme, lovely area. It seems like there might be some traffic going by it. So there's a lot of details that we don't know. And I, I, I don't like the feeling that council is rushed to approve unless council has a lot more information that I don't know about. Um, and if you wanted anybody to answer the question about the opportunity for impactful dialogue, I would be happy, but I'm out of time anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Byron. And, and so uh, there were a couple of questions I'll parse out of there. One of them was around the management of the Cape Boardwalk. Has that been uh, given any thought of? And that's municipal municipally managed right now was also, you know, included as part of the, uh, the previous council's resolutions. So have there, has there been discussion around that from the parks level? Um, I guess through the chair, uh, and thank you for the comments uh, and questions. Um, a couple of things there. Uh, that proposal was made to Metro Vancouver through Bowen staff. Uh, of course, the resolution was made public by the previous council as well. And it was with respect to providing a diversity of experiences and integration. Um, and Metro Vancouver assuming the responsibility for the maintenance of these areas as well as part of our regional park service here on Bowen Island. The second question, which I parsed out of there, which is actually, a, I think, a fairly common question around the island, is, is the number of campsites uh, negotiable? Um, uh, through the chair, at this time, our rezoning proposal includes 100 campsites. Uh, with respect to your questions, at what point does the municipality have an opportunity to feed into the process. I think that's the process that Amanda detailed. That's the open houses. And that's also the purpose of this meeting today. The referral in Daniel's, um, sorry, Mr. Martin's report to um, all of those committees is at the place where that discussion and that dialogue will occur. That's a level of detail that's essential and I think critical to making sure that we end up in a good place. Councillor uh, Jorgensen. Sorry, uh, perhaps I missed it, but nothing in there seemed to indicate. You said that currently the proposal has 100 campsites in there, but nothing really indicated whether that was or was not negotiable, which I believe was the original question. And to so the chair, I appreciate the question, Councillor Jorgensen. And at this time, we're saying that we're submitting a proposal for up to 100 campsites, uh, sorry, 100 campsites at, um, as part of this rezoning application. And through the process, um, that could be changed, but we're starting that process now, and we look forward to that dialogue. Thank you, Mr. Rupa. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barry. Unless Jane Mather has uh, reappeared, that's all that we have. Well, that was an incredibly civilized set of public comments and Q&A. Go Bowen Island. Um, you get out of the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't quite experienced that yet. However, you know, from this chair, I mean, we've heard a variety of perspectives and input today. We've seen hundreds of pages of letters come in. And um, just on behalf of council, 
I'd like to express thanks for the community's participation, for the community's passion, for the um, constructiveness, and, and even some of the, the real detail put into the responses and the comments and the conversations we've had. I know that they've certainly helped inform uh, my view of the project, and also uh, I know that council has councillors have expressed to me on a number of occasions that they've very much appreciated uh, the public input. Um, and I suppose, uh, given that we have a little bit of time left, are there any other questions or comments um, from council at this point before we, Councillor Morris? Um, I'm assuming through the process as we've done in other zonings. There could be a covenant with conditions, so the phasing of the campgrounds could clearly be covered in a covenant, so that and you know an agreement. And also in other rezonings, you hear the thing when you get back the feedback from the public, um, and then we have some back and forth with the applicant as to maybe what might be a better solution. And I think we're just starting that process. Um, one of the things I know everybody's concerned about is how do we control the number of people that come? Now, I've heard, was, was it reservations for day camp, day visitors as well as campsite visitors, or was it just for campsites? Uh, to the chair, yes. Yeah. To both. Oh, okay, so clarify that one. And then, um, because we had a tourism, well, was doing a tourism management, and one of the, the big issues at the session I went to was it, yes, tourism is good, but it can be too good and too many people. Um, and then I guess the other is when we had the national park, and I, I will photocopy for everybody, BC Ferries was specifically asked by BC Parks um, with regard to um, expected increase in tourist visitation. And there was, a, there was a study done on tourism visitation and expected visitation. So I don't know if, if that kind of a study has been done. But anyhow, BC Ferries was specifically asked to comment on the impact of the ferry system. And um, so I, I think we should be asking for that same sort of thing again. Okay. Yeah. I will send that to everybody. And parking, I guess, um, is the other issue I'm, I'm hearing comments about. So how do you control parking off-site? Like if people come, there's no parking in the parking lot, where do they park? Is that something that would fall to our bylaw officers or would, would we be able to negotiate um, parking management Parking management on the public roads by Metro? Anyhow, just something else I think to throw into the discussion. Okay. So questions of, and maybe I'll refer that stack of questions to our unassuming manager of planning who's sitting in the front row there, both around the issue of uh, 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 covenants to manage the phase in or the number of campsites as well as the uh, parking. Regarding covenants, the like council has the ability to place the section 219 covenants. Um, and it, it's, it's fairly common on the one and our agency a restrictive covenant to govern a um, rezoning. Um, in particular, there's elements of rezoning that council wants to capture that um, are not captured by zoning. And so it's not uncommon for us to go with a, a bylaw that says we'll have a covenant that has these conditions and that council would give third reading to a bylaw and then not consider fourth reading until that covenant has been adopted. Um, and I think in this case, there would be, regardless, so we have a report in the, or comment in the staff report about the need for sprinklers for buildings, for example. Um, there is an existing covenant, I think, for residential dwellings required sprinklers, and, and the fire department comment was to see sprinklers in a greater variety of buildings. So you know, we, would, we would be looking, regardless, for some sort of covenant. But if there's specific things that council sees through the process and says, okay, I'm okay with the use, but I have specific concerns that could be captured through the covenant. So that's a mechanism. Um, the second question regarding parking. I, I don't think that's something we've discussed with Metro at this point, but but it would be a consideration if the sort of the traffic management of the park is contingent on there's not parking available at the park, so it'll drive people to drive people to use a shuttle or, or non-vehicle transportation. It kind of defeats the purpose of instead all the cars are parked along Keep Driving White Sail. 
through the chair, if I can add a few comments to that. Um, certainly, in, in all of our park sites, we would always work closely with the municipality to to, uh, to manage parking. I think in terms of the park shuttle and, and that comprehensive look, we need to take an access. Uh, parking is an important part of it. And one option uh, to consider in terms for overnight use and potentially other use is to have a shuttle that serves parking off-site. We've got a number of parks uh, that could, could support uh, satellite parking. So we would want to take that whole, whole cycle look at, at access. The chair, if I could just clarify that even more, um, we've looked at other sites North Shore as well, where we have ample parking that could potentially be utilized as shuttle bus pick up and drop off sites as well. And that's something we're exploring in our transportation study that I mentioned in our presentation earlier. Um, uh, Banff National Park, Jasper National Park are two parks that have a park bus example where there's off site shuttles. And we also do pilot a seasonal shuttle uh, at Boundary Bay Regional Park in Delta as well. Um, utilizing, um, particularly in the summer, school parking lots are generally empty, and we use a big church and school parking lot um, where we encourage the public to come to, and we utilize social media to, to drive the traffic there as opposed to driving the traffic. So it's, it's another way of mitigating the cars. Our goal is to not have a whole bunch of cars that would park on the cove and hop on the shuttle. That is not what we're proposing. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Getty, then Councillor Fast. Um, we heard this morning at the tour that there was a number of covenants that had uh, existed uh, on the property. I'm just wondering if uh, Metro Park staff can provide. Um, I have, I've seen one about tree cutting, but I haven't seen any others. I've seen one that was an archaeological site that was registered. But uh, rather than asking our staff to look it all up, if you know of them already, then it would be helpful if we had um, some list of what all the covenants are that exist. Um, and whether they've been registered with the province or with the municipality, I don't know. But um, if they're out there, then it'd be good to know. Um, and with respect to timing, it seems to me that whether there's a shuttle or whether there's golf carts or whether there's parking in the cove or whether there's, you know, the, the school parking lot is our overload ferry marshalling area. So I'm not sure that that's necessarily going to be available as filled with um, cars all weekend in terms of the farmer's market, whatever. But, um, the traffic management, transportation and, and management, I think, is, is critical. And, um, you know, whether it's a, an update on the report from BC Ferries or anything else, what's the timeline? And, Jeff, you mentioned something earlier, but I missed the, the date. Um, um, what's the earliest we could expect that in terms of all of this getting rushed and pushed in terms of us making decisions? I think that that's fundamental. And um, with respect to parking, um, I just had a great plan for Fraser's five-year-old. And I lived out by the PE and everybody, all during the PE, they had the kids out with the signs going, parking, 10 bucks. <laughs> I'm not opposed to that. I'm going to take back. All right, so the, let's just the, keep, this, keep this around the table here. I would also ask councillors, let's do one question at a time because we're getting club sandwiches of questions that um, need to go to a bunch of different places. I, so uh, it looks like Mr. Redpath would like to respond. Thanks, Mary Lyon. So, uh, um, and thank you, Councillor, for the questions. Um, on the first one, with respect to the covenants, the covenants which are currently restricted, uh, registered on the site, BIM would certainly be aware of because it is still private property and they were registered on the private property. So that information um, Mr. Martin should be able to provide access to. Um, I, it's probably where we got it from uh, in the first place and the owner. And um, in, in addition to um, the uh, timeline for the parking study, I think Jeff had mentioned that we're, it's, it's imminent, it's underway and it's imminent, and we hope to have that in due course for those committees that this is being referred to today, subject to you approving the recommendation that you have uh, for consideration on your agenda, um, uh, because we, we know that that's essential information. Um, and there was a question with respect to the utilization of the school or, or I, I would charge $15. I, guess, <laughs> I, but, um, uh, we, I was referencing off, off island uh, parking, uh, not off island. I hope I got them all. Thank you. Good. Councilor um, Yeah, as much as I would love to be talking about the nature there and the importance of protecting biodiversity in this big crisis, I'm not going to. I'm going to ask another question. Um, as somebody who long ago worked for Metro Vancouver Parks and tried to offer education programs over here on Crippen. Um, at that time, 
what I found was the best way was to actually meet people in the Horseshoe Bay Ferry Terminal, bring them over here on the top of the bus. Otherwise, everybody would miss their ferries. They'd have a lousy time and uh, they want their money back, basically. Um, and, uh, and I never had anybody to show around beautiful bow and, a beautiful, and to connect them with nature. So my question is, knowing about, um, having, hearing you mention a little bit about a shuttle bus, I know you don't have a big plan, I don't think. Um, would you consider a shuttle bus that would meet people at that side so they could unload their gear or uh, bicycles maybe or whatever on, onto it and um, not maybe skip the bikes and come across uh, with them taking up just a little piece of the ferry, collecting all those people and taking them uh, on. Um, and I'm mentioning this specifically because you might not be aware of the former Peter King's bus, um, which uh, operated a little bit like that in terms of running people into downtown, but uh, uh, sort of shuttle and um and it was successful until the beginning of covid when everybody stopped commuting for a while and uh um and i don't mean to i just mean the idea of a shuttle i think has potential a shuttle that goes on the ferry and that people can leave their gear on i think um anyway i wonder if this is something you're considering um through the chair yes and that's the example we were talking about so some of our other work Parks um, in the North Shore, in particular, would be excellent marshalling points for that shuttle to, uh, with ample parking, taking the pressure off the cove. Um, I, I, I have had conversations with, with other councillors um, uh, uh, and who have said that you know there's a, not just a very crunch, but there's a crunch in that cove as well, and, and uh, that's one of our potential uh, solutions. Oh, I'll just add that there's also a crunch in Horseshoe Bay. You yeah. can't park there, but you can get there on the 257 bus or whatever, uh, right there. So, but it, that was part of the problem that was long ago, 30 years ago, we couldn't find a parking space, so they missed it. Anyway. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments from councillors? We'll start with your recommendation. Seeing none, we do have a recommendation on the agenda. Uh, I would ask council to this position. So fast. I'd like to move the motion because uh, I'd like to move the recommendation because I think this is uh, worth pursuing, inquiring, exploring. I'm curious and uh, I want to um, move that the committee of the whole recommend that council adopt the following resolution. That council refer rezoning OCP 2023 to the Advisory Planning Commission, Community Economic Development Committee, <laughs> Environment and Climate Action Committee, advice, sorry, Action Advisory Committee, Housing Advisory Committee, um, Parks, Trails, Greenways Advisory Committee, Transportation Advisory Committee, Finance Advisory Committee, Bowen Island Conservancy, Islands Trust, Vancouver Coastal Health, BC Ferries, the Squamish First Nation, and the Committee of the whole of Bowen Island Council again, and that council require the applicant to hold the public oh, uh, information meeting on this application and that council direct staff to report back on the results of this referral with the draft bylaw for council's consideration. It's been moved, seconded by Councillor Saunders. Um, any discussion on the motion? I see uh, two hands, so I'll go Councillor Jurgensen and then uh, uh, Councillor Morse, followed by Councillor Giddy. I would request a friendly amendment to add the Accessibility Advisory Committee to that list. Okay. It's uh, a good idea. So no such thing as friendly amendments, but yeah. we've got a, um, so a mover to make an amendment. Is there a seconder for that amendment? Saying my counselor fast um, uh, to the CAO. I just don't know that that committee is fully established at, at this point. Could we just say when established? We say when established at the end of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. So amendment to amend the amendment. Do I have a second for that? <laughs> Great. Uh, any discussion on that, or actually, I'll, I'll do a unanimous consent. Any objections to that amendment? To have the amendment. Seeing none, we now have uh, the addition of the accessibility committee um, when established. Call the question on that one as well. Any objections? 
Seeing none, that carries by unanimous consent. So we are back to the main motion on the floor. Uh, to Councillor Morse. So two questions. One is they're already holding a public information process. So I'm curious as to why we're requiring them to hold a public information meeting. But they've already laid out a public process. Or is that just sort of housekeeping? So maybe I'll refer that to the manager planning, whether any of the existing engagement uh, events would count as a public hearing. Oh, but this is not that. Or sorry. Yeah. Information meeting? Information meeting. Mr. Chair, the, yes, the, the open houses mentor are proposing meet our sort of our bylaw requirements for a, an information meeting. So this is just to sort of to verify that council is requiring this as part of the process. Okay, so it's, it's um, I's and T's. It's not adding them to do anything more than they're already doing. Correct. It's, yeah, what they propose would meet our, our requirements. Thank you. And uh, then my second question yes. is, um, the council directs staff to report back on results of this referral, which I have absolutely no problem with, with a draft bylaw. I'm wondering if that draft bylaw part is a bit premature and we should have a committee of the whole on the results of the referrals and then request the draft bylaw. That's an interesting question that council would need to answer in the form of an amendment to this recommendation. So I would move that we sever the recommendation at this point and only vote on the first two clauses and then we can vote on the other one separately. Okay. So we can we can deal with these uh, one at a time. Um, maybe what I'll do is- Just let's, severing the last clause. Just let, severing the last clause, okay. Mm -hmm. Hang on, let me wrap my head around that. What was, what was that one? Motion to defer a matter of order. Uh, so motion to postpone can happen at, at any time. However, what this would do would postpone the motion in the committee of the whole. Um, what this recommendation is doing is coming back to our council meeting this evening. So it would likely be if there was a motion to postpone, it would likely be more appropriate at the council meeting this evening. Good question. Yes. The other alternatives that we had was um, to Committee of the whole refer the application to staff for more information prior to council taking any action on this application. I sit on two or three of those committees and I'm not sure what we're going to be discussing um, specifically. And I think that, you know, there's a number of things that have come up that we need a lot more information on. And um, the transportation one, for instance, is imminent. So before we start um, down the road of everybody spending a whole lot of time um, trying to work through something that you know, we're going to come back with, I don't have enough information. I'd like more information. We need more information on this. And, um, which I think is possibly what we could get out of all of our committees working. And they've got plenty to work on other than this project. Mm -hmm. um, then um, I, think we're, I think we're rushing it, even going to committees. Uh, I'm not sure if that alternative can come up as um, one of our options. Um, at this point, now that there's this other uh, motion and seconder on the floor, but that's deferral or I don't, I'm not familiar enough with Robert's rules. I can give you evidence, but not Robert's rules. We could do postponement. So just as, so I'll take that as a point of parliamentary inquiry. There's, so this recommendation is getting referred to council this evening um, and then council will be dealing with it again and there will need to be a uh, in a second to approve it as a, as a council resolution. So right now, because this is committee of the whole, we're making a recommend. Those in the audience, it's a little convoluted. We're making a recommendation to send it back up to uh, to council, and that that's where it kind of gets the formal um, seal. Yes. Uh, sorry, I can't remember if Councillor Jurgensen was up. Councillor Jurgensen. Yeah. So Councillor Jurgensen, then Councillor Saunders. Sorry, I was just willing to second Allison's. Uh, moving of her oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah, we don't need a motion to sever. <clears throat> um, Councilor Saunders, then Councilor Morris. Um, just in respect to what Councilor Getty just commented on about sending this to committee at this point, and is that premature? Um, my impression of this, and maybe I have the wrong impression, was that right now our guests from Metro Band, you know, they, they understand they're going to be asked for more information, but my impression was that the committees would say, I need more information 
of this, this, and this. And that was the purpose of this rather than wait for them to give us information that we may or may not have, or we may or may not need even at this point, but it's to give direction to some extent to Metro, to the parks people wait and say, we need answers on this specifically. Okay. I'm gonna interject one offer. If I saw some nods from the Metro Vancouver folks, is what is your take on? Through the chair, um, that interpretation is correct three phases. This first one is listen and learn. And so we can't come in assuming to know what all of the concerns and interests and opportunities are. So the first set of discussion is to start, start to peel back. What are the things that we need? Who else do we need to talk to? What are the conversations do we need to have? And where are the other places that we need to fill in data? We've been able to make some assumptions based on what we know and what we've heard, but we can't assume to know everything. So it would be to further unravel what those questions and needs are. Thank you. To the CAO. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, and just to echo what uh, um, Amanda, Ms. McGregg said, um, and, and in response to Councillor Saunders, the um, the intention here is for the first initial look for these committees, and there's certainly uh, gaps in information that they would need, um, but there's definitely discussion and dialogue that they could have on the application as it currently stands. And this would not be the first and only engagement with those committees. Uh, every time that this uh, application will come back to council, there will be other opportunities for re referrals and, and going back out to all of those committees for additional. Thank you. Council Morris? Well, I'm assuming all the information will be, is, you know, will be presented. Now, will Metro Vancouver be sending representatives to these various committee meetings to present the proposal to the committee so they understand what is being proposed? I will uh, probably throw that over to the Director of Communications. Yes. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, and so I'm just gonna tack on a question that that uh, begs because there's, there's going to be things that, we, and this is a question to Metro Vancouver generally in terms of what it is that you want out of our committees. So if we're going to make a referral, um, we know that there's going to be things that they're going to ask us flat out. Transportation study, uh, probably some environmental impact for the proposed use because we don't, you know, there is the uh, environmental assessment that's attached to the current application, but we don't see an environmental assessment that's attached to the proposed use of camping. And um, uh, knowing that it's difficult to, you know, say here's what the park looks like and then engage with it is very tricky, right? And it sounds like the intent of the engagement process is to have the community have their say, what is it you'd like this thing to look like and, and what is it you would like to have out of it. I'm curious as this gets referred to committee, what is the most valuable information for Metro Vancouver to receive back from this list of committees? Um, to the chair, I think number one, um, the suggestion for referral to committees was from your staff. Um, that wasn't our request. Um, so we're happy, as Ms. McQuaig had mentioned, we're happy to support any information that those committees may require and ensure that we're sending the same information to every committee in whatever form would be most suitable. Um, what we, um, I, I will just remind council again that this is a land use planning discussion and that the park planning and design, the detailed design of what will be, what could be constructed in the future is, will come later and will be evolving through this process. This process with respect to land use will be informing what the ultimate plan would look like. And right now we're seeking a land use decision um, from Bowen Island Municipality with respect to overnight use. And that uh, what is what we understand is the focus of this uh, discussion with the committees is uh, as well. Okay. Thank you. Any other further questions, comments, debate on the um, first? Yeah. Everything except the, the, yeah, I see three that's. So everything but the last that. Everything except the phrase that council directs staff to report back on results of this referral with the draft bylaw for council's consideration. Everything above that. Everything above that. Yes. Seeing none, I will call the question. All in favor, raise your hand, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Raise your hand, say nay. 
Councilor Getty uh, opposed. Moving on to uh, the last paragraph that council directs staff to report back on results of this referral of the draft bylaw for council's consideration. Councilor Morris. I ask that that be severed because I think given the magnitude of the questions and concerns we were hearing from the, the, the public, um, that the first step should be that council direct staff to report back on the results of these referrals to a committee of the whole of council, period. And then that committee of the whole can make a recommendation as to whether to go ahead with the draft bylaw and what should be in it. Okay. After that. So I would move the council direct staff to report back on. Hang on, this is an amendment to the motion that's already been moved. It, seconded, right? No, nope. that has not been moved. Into the, the amendment has not. So uh, Council Morris is making an amendment. So the amendment has not been moved in second. But oh. the whole resolution originally was, and that's why we've severed. So I would move that the um, resolution, the clause, be amended to delete the words with a draft bylaw for council's consideration and insert. Um, to a committee of the whole of council. I'll forget about the typos. Okay. Second. Well, seconded by Councilor Wake. Uh, any discussion on uh, this part of the motion? Councilor Fast. Yeah, I'd just like to know um, why we wouldn't just let uh, staff go ahead with the to draft a bylaw. Um, because uh, they're taking all that input from our um, committees and, uh, and draft a bylaw that has to do with the change of use to overnight camping. So I, I'm, uh, I'm wondering why we would need another committee the whole um, after the other input that's going on. It seems to me to be stretching out the uh, process. So I'd just like to know uh, why it's needed. Uh, maybe I'll let Councillor Morse uh, respond materially to her motion. Without seeing the results of all the referrals and the summation of all this input, um, we don't know how we want to proceed. And that's why I think it should come to a committee of the whole. If, if the will of Council right now today is to move a resolution that we proceed with a draft bylaw to permit camping, then what's the point of wasting everybody's time with referrals? I'm adding credibility to the process in my mind. Councilor Getty? We also don't have all the information that's going to the committees. And there may be information that comes from the committees that we would want to get before we made a decision. So, uh, <clears throat> just as a point of information to the manager of planning, um, when we look at a rezoning, the draft bylaw would come back to council for a first reading. Um, and usually in rezoning processes, I'm curious about what do you see happens between first reading and adoption? What kind of changes do you see? What kind of additional information would we require from the proponent? And what would happen um, within that accordion space as you described? Um, to the chair, so I think first of all, I typically seek the direction to come back with results of referral and the bylaw, um, but at that meeting, bringing the bylaw back to its council's discretion to proceed with the giving first reading, consideration of first reading to a bylaw, or directing amendments to the bylaw at that point and sending it back to staff rather than giving first reading. If, if, if council has different opinions in staff how a bylaw, what a bylaw should be captured. Mm -hmm. um, and then to the second question about what happens after first reading, typically then our process is we again refer to committees. Um, on the details of the bylaw, we often then require an additional um, open house when there's a specific bylaw to be considered. Okay. Um, often, depending on the nature of the rezoning, we'll require um, technical information and studies on the, the rezoning application between first reading before consideration of second reading. Is often how it's phrased and saying, you know, council in giving first reading says, okay, we're, we're comfortable proceeding generally with what's proposed, but we want more technical information before we are comfortable proceeding to a second reading, proceeding to a public hearing. Um, so that can happen as well in, in that space between first and second reading. Okay, so then just, just so I'm clear, it's not, so from a process standpoint, it's not out of the question that this referral gets made to committees. Um, we are gonna get feedback from committees on a 
bunch of information that they will require on a spectrum of issues. Um, the draft bylaw can be drafted, and then at that point, there will be another referral, which would likely take up some of those technical elements and, and, and technical reports or research and analysis that's been requested from the committees. Um, to the chair, yes. So, for example, at the meeting tonight, we will be considering first readings for the um, obvious Bay Road result. So, it's going to be November. So, it's going to be right now it's back on your agenda with a bylaw for consideration of first reading and referral to committees again. So, that's our typical process is that the committees would see it twice. So, the first time they provide comment on it, and then they can have it back and see how council has responded, and the applicant has responded to that comment and it's been captured. All right. Okay. Uh, to the CIO. And um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just to add on to Planner Martin's comments, too, that uh, because this is an amendment to the OCP, that it does require after second uh, after second reading, I believe, when if I look at the Islands Trust uh, website correctly, that we uh, in our agreement protocol with them, that it would go to the Islands Trust for their consideration. So it's possible that the Islands Trust comes back with some uh, comments for consideration of, of amendments too. And then after third reading and prior to adoption, it has to go back to the trust again for final. So there are multiple touch points for council where there could be uh, changes. And then depending on the significance of those changes, um, where they are in the it may require a, a second public open house. Okay. Uh, Councillor Fest? Yeah, just to uh, thank you for answering my question. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to vote against this um, amendment because I prefer, I think I was elected to make decisions and I was uh, coming to a council meeting doing the preparation. I prefer to have a draft in front of me to respond to. Uh, rather than just a, um, uh, a report on all the good input that we're going to receive. But I'd prefer to get to the draft stage and then we can start making changes to the draft or uh, asking more questions or whatever. But I'd just like to have something to um, uh, work with. Thank you. If I may, I might propose... An amendment, an amendment to the amendment that uh, council uh, might consider uh, that incorporates some of the feedback that I'm hearing around the table. Um, I think of having the referrals to all of our committees come back in one shot, as well as information that's going to come back from Metro Vancouver in one shot, and attempting to deal with that at a regular council meeting, which I think is what Council Morris is partially expressing, um, would be difficult. So I'm curious whether council would have the appetite to uh, consider an amendment to the amendment that would read something like the original uh, uh, resolution, report back on the results of this referral with a draft bylaw for council's consideration, um, as well as feedback referred to committees um, at a committee of the whole meeting. That's not a great wording, but the, the essence is that um, we're going to come back to this with all of the information from committees, with the information from Metro Vancouver, and we are going to try and cook the impossible burger of um, dealing with that in a uh, committee of the whole. Council uh, Best? That would be fine with me as long as we've got a draft bylaw to be uh, working on. Yes. And so, uh, I don't mind if it's at a regular council meeting or at a committee of the whole. I'm, uh, that would be fine. Okay. So I would second your motion if you make it. So if I was to add clarity to that language, it would be that council an amendment to the amendment to strike the amendment and to have the resolution read that council directs staff to report back on the results of this referral, the draft bylaw for council's consideration at a committee of the whole meeting pending committee feedback and input. Isn't pending the same as reporting back on the results of the referrals? Oh, yes. Sorry. Strike that. Uh, at a committee of the whole. Yeah, at a committee of the whole. Council. Well, the amendment's been moved and seconded, so you're going to have to vote on it. 
the one I made. All right. Not withdrawing. All right. Alice is not withdrawing. All right. So let's just, uh, maybe let's, uh, oh, the fun of process. <laughs> so let's dispose with uh, Allison's amendment. Um, uh, and not dispose as a get rid of it, but find a disposition on it. Um, so what is the current amendment that is on the table uh, to our corporate officer? Uh, the council directs staff to report back on results of this referral to a committee of whole with council. That's what has been moved in second. Oh, without the draft bylaw. Yeah, Correct. Well, yeah. I, the amendment was that we delete with a draft bylaw and insert. Yeah. So Councilor Morris's amendment reads the council directs staff to report back results of the referral to the committee of the whole with council. That's been moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion on this amendment? Council Baker. Can you just clarify what your concern is? Are you just changing committee of the whole to regular council? Because we've, we've the uh, Council Morse's amendment drops the formulation of a draft bylaw. Okay. Um, so it drops the, uh, the recommendation to correct staff to uh, um, draft the bylaw. So it's just dealing with the uh, results of our referrals to committees. And what would we do with them? Oh, just... Councilor Fast. Council Fast. And, uh, and, and then the question why I want to have a draft in front of me is because I want to know what do I do with all that uh, wonderful input and um, that's why I prefer to have a draft. So the amendment that's currently on there does not include asking staff to draft a bylaw. That's correct. Yes. Councilor Gideon. Um, Calling the question, uh, anybody opposed to calling the question on the amendment? Seeing none, we will vote on the amendment that the that reads that council directs staff to report back on results of this referral to a committee of the whole with council. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand, say aye. 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 Opposed, raise your hand, say nay. Nay. Uh, the ayes have it, so motion carries. Okay. And that, I believe, get referred to council uh, this evening. Or just uh, for council Jerusalem's benefit, to identify who was. Oh, opposed was uh, Councillor Saunders, Mayor Leonard, and Councillor Fast. Now, well, that was the amendment you voted on. That was now the amendment. Now you've got to vote on the amendment. Great. Vote. So now we are at the amended. Motion, which reads that council directs staff to report back the results of this referral to a committee of the whole with council. Any discussion on this? Council Pass, if you would like to have the drafting of a bylaw, this would be the place to uh, make an amendment. I had a motion that included the draft bylaw. Mm -hmm. That was amended so that it wasn't included. That's right. And I'm not going to bother trying to put it back in again. So any uh, further discussion before I call the question? Seeing none, I will call the question uh, that council direct staff to report back on the results of this referral. Committee of the whole with council. All in favor, raise your hand and say aye. Aye. All opposed, raise your hand and say nay. Nay. Uh, the ayes have it. Councillor Jurgensen, Councillor Fast, and Mayor Leonard. I believe that is everything on our agenda for the day. Uh, just for this meeting. Just for this meeting. We have another, another one this afternoon. So I will look for a uh, motion to adjourn. So moved by Councillor Saunders, second by Councillor Getty. Uh, see no objections. We are adjourned. Thank you so much to the community that has come and hung out with us for uh, this fun process this afternoon. Uh, hearing more from you as, as things unfold.